All right, so today is July 22nd, and we're going to start with, like I said, kinesiology, because we want to talk about joint mobilizations today. So we've talked briefly about these before. What are joint mobilizations? What's the difference between joint mobilizations and range of motion? Because they're both movements of the joint. What's the difference? What are, what's joint mobilizations target tissue? Let's go there. What, what are we trying to help when we do joint mobilizations? Because the whole thing that we're gonna do in physical therapy is we go after targeted tissue. Yeah, right, so what's that called? The ligaments and tendons is called the, the joint what? The joint capsule, right. So joint mobilizations, the target tissue is the capsule of the joint. That means if you've got somebody that has a capsular pattern, which we've talked about a lot in range of motion, that's what we're gonna use these joint mobilizations for. So can joint mobilization, turn the fan down a little bit, that's annoying me. Can joint mobilizations drastically improve range of motion? What do you think? Like, could it take me from 45 degrees to 120 degrees, a range of motion? So, yes, no, probably not. I like, we've got the whole gambit here. So it could help that range of motion only if what is the problem? if the joint capsule is the issue, right? So if the joint capsule is what's limiting us, then yes, joint mobilizations will help us with mobilization. But what if the problem is a tight bicep? Joint mobilization is gonna do a ton with it? No, right, then we need to do what? If the muscle is the tight part, then we've got to Stretch it, right? So this is just another tool in your toolbox is what joint mobs are. And you've got to think of that because when we're doing physical therapy, we have to pull the right tools out. If we don't pull the right tools out, we're not going to get the results we want, right? So let's say that you've got a patient that has a capsular pattern of the shoulder. Just doing stretching on that patient may not actually improve the range of motion. It may because when you do do, a, do do, when you stretch the patient, you will get a little bit of lengthening of the joint capsule and opening of the joint capsule, but you may not get as much effective treatment as you would get from doing direct joint mobilizations on the area and part of the tissue that's affected, right? So if my joint capsule and the anterior capsule on my shoulder is the problem. So I've got anterior capsulitis. You're going to mobilize me probably posteriorly, maybe a little bit inferiorly, maybe a little superiorly in order to kind of loosen up that joint capsule. But just going and stretching the bicep is still going to mobilize the capsule, right? So it doesn't necessarily mean that stretching's out, but it's one more tool that you can kind of put in that toolbox and go, hey, let's try this. It's almost like, you know, with heat, right? With heat with modalities. We have our hot packs. Hot packs are great. They warm up things. But what other modalities do we have for heat? Ultrasound, good. What else? Paraffin, good, right? That's what the, that's the therapy for fish, paraffin. No? Okay. What else do we have? You guys probably didn't talk too much about some of the other ones. You guys remember fluidotherapy? The corn husks? Did you guys talk about that one? 
barely, right? And one reason we talk about it very barely is because it's a big machine, right? What's the one with um, microwave heat? Diathermy, right? So we have all of those tools in our toolbox. We don't just have to do hot pack. Hot pack's great, but we have all those tools. Same idea here. We've got stretching, we've got strengthening, we've got joint mobilizations. Not always are those individual exercises for this person, right? If a person comes in with balance issues and the first thing we jump to is doing vestibular training with them, it's gonna improve their balance, but what if the stimulus training is not the problem? The real problem is they have an unstable ankle. Well, they're gonna get some from that vestibular training to work that ankle, but it'd been better to go, okay, let's strengthen that ankle or maybe brace it. So that's where this tool comes in. It's, it's another tool that you have in your toolbox, right? You're not gonna pull out a hammer and smack a screw, right? You're gonna pull out a screwdriver. Right, and not only are you gonna pull out a screwdriver, but you gotta figure out what heads on the screw so that you pull out the right screwdriver, right? We have joint mobilizations, but if the problem's the anterior capsule and we're mobilizing the posterior capsule, we're not using the right screwdriver. That's kind of what you gotta think about when we're doing physical therapy here, is we have all these tools, and each of these tools has a little different shape, right? There's a ball peen hammer, and then there's you know claw hammer. Each of those have different things, and there's a sledgehammer. Each of those have a different use in you know, construction. And if you pull out a sledgehammer when you need a claw hammer, you know, the, although it may still work, oh, you might have problems. Same idea here. So it's a manual therapy technique to modulate pain and treat joint impairments that limit range of motion by specifically altering the mechanics of the joint, right? So that's the important part, kind of the idea behind joint mo mobilizations and manipulations. So there's all kinds of terms out there, right? We have thrust manipulations or high velocity thrust, HVT mobs. If I say HVT mobs, what's the first word that should come into your mind as a PTA? Thrust mobs or high velocity thrust, high velocity thrust. What should be our thinking about that as PTAs? No, 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 not today, right? High velocity thrust and thrust manipulations are all the specific domain of the PT. We cannot do those. We're gonna talk about the different feelings of them, right? So that's when we think of those high velocity thrusts, we've gotta be thinking about the PTA or PT. If it says grade five mobilizations on your exercise sheet when you're working with a patient, you need to get the PT for those. They need to be doing them. Self-mobilization. Can anyone give me an example of a self-mobilization mode? Yeah, right? Cracking your fingers. I was just sitting here doing cracking my knuckles. Um uh, uh, there, right? Self-mobilizations work. We all have kind of figured out ways to self-mobilize, right? T uh, good T-spine foam rolling, right? Have any of you ever sat there and you're like, your ankle feels really weird. It kind of feels like there's pressure in it. And you sit there and you just kind of roll it around until you get that nice pop. And you get that pop and the ankle feels better. Or maybe it's the neck. You're like, oh, oh crunch. And you're like, oh, there we go. That's the good stuff, right? That's a self mo Mobilization with movement. Well, when we're doing mobilization with movement, we're having them do functional activities that are going to mobilize the joint segment. And then when we talk about the physiological movements of joint modes, we're talking about the osteokinematics, right? The bone movements themselves of the joint. Accessory movements, we already talked about like the component motion with the scapula with the shoulder abduction or shoulder flexion, right? We know that it goes for every one degree up, it goes two degrees, right? The joint play, oftentimes you hear that, there's too much play in this joint. That's the Arthur kinematics, how much movement's actually available inside the joint. Manip under anesthesia, we'll talk about briefly as well. Um, it's not something PTAs do, but PTs possibly can start getting involved in this. And then muscle energy technique. 
Has any of you ever heard of muscle energy technique or METS? And not METS as in the energy used, right? What, what's a muscle energy technique? How many of you guys, how would you describe it if you've seen it? Have any of you seen somebody do muscle energy? I, it's, it's funny, when I think, of, and when I went to my first muscle energy technique course, I thought, oh, this is going to be cool. And then what I kind of realized is it's kind of PNF with joint mobilizations, right? It's neuromuscular movements adding in some joint mobilization and getting the joints and everything to move in the proper alignment. So we'll talk briefly about that. I am not a specialist in muscle energy technique whatsoever. So we talked about the osteo and arthrokinematics again. The osteokinematics are the bone movement at the joint. The arthrokinematics are the joint surface movements, right? So if I'm talking about the humerus on the acetabulum, right? So I'm talking the humerus on the acetabulum. Am I talking about osteokinematics or arthrokinematics? Really, none of you are going to correct me on that one? I hope I'm not talking about either of them. They just said the humerus on the acetabulum. You guys aren't awake yet. It's okay. Right? Oh, now it makes sense, right? But yes, the humerus on the actual glenohumeral socket, that would be an osteokinematic, right? thought it was a joke. I just need to mainline coffee, although I will say that it takes a little bit more decaf coffee than it does the regular coffee to kind of get me going, because definitely it's not the same kick, right? Arthur kinematics, then we're talking about the overall functional movement of the joint. Does it slide, glide, and move? So the gross movement of the shafts of the bone rather than movement of the joint surfaces, and osteokinematics is our goniometry, right? Active range of motion patient's doing it. Passive range of motion, we're doing it or a machine is doing it for the patient, but there's no contraction going on. And this is the big thing is usually with passive, we learn this, passive, there's usually more range of motion than active because the patient can relax a little bit and doesn't guard as much. So we talked about end feels, right? It's a feeling by the examiner as a barrier to further motion. This will take hands-on experience, guys, and that's why one of the things we're going to be doing in one of our first labs is feeling the end feels because you need to get the idea of what they feel like on one of your fellow students, right? Bony or hard is bone contact and bone. Where is the only bony end feel in the body that is normal, really? Elbow, right? Now there's some other areas where you may feel a bony end feel, but elbow is the primary area where you're gonna feel that hard end feel. Um, it, 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 there's somewhere that they talk about you can get a bony infill from capital movement, but I'm not going to get into that right now. Soft is where we talk about soft tissue approximation, right? I, when I think about this, I think of bending way over to try to touch my toes. It's not because my hips are tight that I can't touch them. It's because my belly's too big. I get soft tissue approximation. That's why I keep telling myself. And then firm is that muscular capsular or ligamentous stretch. So if you have a firm end feel, especially where one's not supposed to be, like if you start moving my shoulder and you get here and you get a firm end feel, that's when we've got to start playing detective, right? And you're going to find, again, one of the things that I, I like to say about physical therapy is it's all about following the breadcrumbs, right? So the patient's going to come in, give the PT some of the breadcrumbs when they do the eval. And then you're going to start working with them and get a few more breadcrumbs. And then you'll get a few more breadcrumbs. And you'll get a few more breadcrumbs. And hopefully, eventually, you'll have this trail that leads to the patient getting better. And the reason a lot, like uh, the person that said hashtag takes too long for physical therapy probably wasn't getting better is they weren't following the right breadcrumbs. And this is an unfortunate aspect of for-profit PT is we tend to treat every you know, frozen shoulder like every other frozen shoulder. 
And so they come in and the clinic has a protocol and we follow the protocol and the patient gets frustrated because they're not getting any better because we're not following the breadcrumbs. Protocols are important, but why do clinics develop protocols for all patients? Why do you think we have these protocols, you know, that says if total knee replacement, then these exercises and these modalities? Why do you think we have that type of thought process? So they do work for a point, right? Safer is a great, a great thing, but I mean, if we're safe with a patient, we're going to be safe whether we follow a protocol or not, right? But the, the downside to that is billing's one of them, right? And the other thing is, and I hate to say this, who's doing most of the treatment now in physical therapy? Non-licensed people. Yeah, thank you, Erica. Non-licensed people, right? And they lack the ability to have critical thinking. Right? It's not that those of you guys with text or don't have critical thinking. That's not what I'm saying. But you don't have the critical thought as to, you know, we talked about modalities when I talked about their different settings for e-STEM and you know, specifically for just, you know, something like inferential. And some of you are like, well, there's different settings for that. Right. That's because you weren't trained in that. And if you do the wrong setting, you actually don't help the patient. But it's sad that what we've done is we've created this really kind of nasty, vicious circle that we started using tax because reimbursement wasn't great. And now because we're using tax, we're not getting great results, which means what's happening to reimbursement. What's overall happened to reimbursement in physical therapy over the past couple of years? So reimbursement, yeah, it's decreasing, right? And why is it decreasing? Well, because there is some bureaucratics in insurance, right? That's just kind of the way it is. Insurance companies are out for the bottom, bottom line. They don't really, aren't necessarily there to make you better. I hate to say it, guys. I know that this is going to smash your bubble. You know, you think that everyone in the world has your best interest in heart, but insurance companies don't. Right? They have, they're, they're trying to please their stockholders. And if they can you know, restrict you from getting therapy in order to save $25, they'll do it. Right? I've, I mean, like I said, I've seen complex physical therapy cases come in for home health, and the, the insurance company gives us two visits. You know, we had, excuse me, the other day we had, I, it was not the other day, I was about, well, it's before the pandemic. So it's a while ago, I guess now, thinking back like it was yesterday. Oh, it seems so far away. Oh, I believe in yesterday. Um, anyway, uh, we had this patient that came in that was a massive MCA stroke for home health. A huge middle cerebral artery stroke. And the home health approved one visit. First of all, the patient shouldn't have been discharged, I don't think, but neither here nor there. But um, the home health only approved them for one visit. What are we going to get done in one visit? Maybe check for throw rugs? Let them know that the dog needs to be put outside or put with a family member for the time being? We're not going to be able to get a lot done in one visit. All right, so how do, how do I mean... This is getting a little off topic, but how do we fix the reimbursement problem? Any ideas? Because you guys are the up and coming generation of physical therapy, physical therapist assistants. So you're going to be dealing with this real soon. How do we fix reimbursement? Well, let me ask you this. Your car gets damaged, you get in a car accident. And you have a choice of two body shops, right? So you take body shop A, and body shop A, Wilbur comes out, and Wilbur's like, well, tell you what, we can get your car fixed, you know, not going to guarantee it's going to be the right color. It's going to be close, right? And I know that you have a Nissan Sentra, but we got this fender from the Chevrolet Caprice over here. We'll put that fender on. And you know, we'll get you down the road. 
And then you go to repair shop C and they take you in, they take you into the waiting room. In the waiting room, there's coffee, there's some donuts, maybe for you guys that want fruit, there's fruit in that waiting room, right? The whole time they're assessing your car, the adjuster comes and goes, hey, come out here, I wanna talk to you about it. And like, well, do you see where this crease is? That's gonna require us doing this and that to fix this crease. Yes, right? We're, it's not only better quality of care, but we're creating value, right? How do you feel with that second guy that's taking you out, showing you exactly what's wrong with the car, telling you why it's gonna be a little bit more expensive for this, but this is what's gonna happen. What does that set in your mind? What's that, you get that feeling of they care about me. Yeah, right? Doctor's office. Let's set up the modern doctor's office visit. You come into the doctor's office, you walk up to the front desk, you now have a glass screen between you and the person in front of you. You check in, you sit down, you're sitting there for 20 minutes, right? You're, you get there, maybe you get there 20 minutes early, so you're there 20 minutes, you're sitting there 20 minutes, and then five minutes passes when before after your visit, and you're still sitting there, and then 10 minutes and 20 minutes. And then at like 30 minutes after, the front desk goes, hey, Kelly, could you come over to the desk real quick? Hey, I forgot, well, blowing a bubble. I forgot to have you fill out these four forms. Can you fill them out for me before the doctor takes you back? And you pull out the forms, and one of the forms is the size of War and Peace. Right, so it's 50 pages long. So you fill all that up, and then you take it up, and they're like, so the doctor took the case after you. He'll be right with you as soon as, you know, as soon as he gets rid of Michelle, right? And they'll, they'll say, as soon as he gets rid of Michelle. Wait, right? Exactly. Now you're like, wait a minute, getting rid of a patient? And then they take you back, and you're back there, and the nurse comes back, and the nurse or the nurse or the medical tech could be the nicest person in the world, right? They're come back, and they're bubbly, and they're at, so how are you doing? And tell me about what thing. And they're taking your blood pressure and they take your temperature and she's all smiles. And she's like, the doctor will be right in to see you. And then 20 minutes later, you're still sitting in that room. And you know, I've done this. I've gotten up and I looked out the room to make sure they put the flag out to make sure that the doctor knows I'm in there. And finally the doctor comes in, doesn't ask you how you're doing, doesn't ask you, it's like, Okay, so you're here for the flu. Okay, great. You know, based upon your blood pressure, based upon this, here's a script. I need you to go fill this out. All right, is there any questions? Thanks. Have a good day. And they're out the door before you even can say, yeah, I've got a question. All right? They're a victim of this unfortunate profit motive driven too, right? But if they create value, right, it makes you feel better. This is why concierge type doctors and concierge type physical therapies are on the rise you know, where it's one-on-one -on -one care, it's maybe more expensive, but you know, when you get sick or when you have an injury, that therapist has a vested interest in getting you better. What's Pam? Oh, okay, right? Now let's change something here. Post-acute medical, okay, good. Yeah, so I was like, Pam, spray on? Let's change a little bit. So now, you know, you come in and you're greeted at the front desk and, you know, your paperwork's all done by physical, you, they send you everything in advance. So you have all the paperwork done. You get to the front desk, she checks you in. She goes, great, I got your paperwork here. Just making sure this is all correct. She checks with you first of all. And it's like, okay, so you're here to see because you've got right shoulder issues. Okay, great. Now we know what the problem is. I'll tell you what, let me get somebody to take you back. So they come and they take you back and you're back in the room for five seconds, and the physical therapist comes in, the first thing the physical therapist does is sits down right in front of you and looks you in the eye and tells you, can you tell me a little bit about this? Automatically, just sitting down across from you has created value, right? This is why I do try when I, with my patients, I try to sit down a little bit with them, even if it's only for a few minutes, because there's something about it. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna use, the current presidential election a little bit as well with that. Because when you see Trump interacting with the public and then you see Biden interacting with the public, what does Biden do a little bit more than Trump does? 
Has anyone, have you ever, have you guys seen the difference between the two when they're talking to the public? Has anyone paid attention at all? Biden is old school politics, right? He gets in their faces. He maybe he's a little bit too touchy. I, I guess he smells hair. I don't know. Um, but he gets that kind of personal attention for the people. He is a little creepy, yeah. Um, but, you know, and he has those stories that he can relate to the, you know, he was a single father. He can relate to the single parents. He can relate to people, you know, the average ordinary person where it's a little harder for somebody that's been rich all their life to relate to, you know, the struggles of somebody that's making minimum wage. It just is. Even though Biden probably hasn't made minimum wage since he was 16. It's just interesting the way that value is created. And that's what we need to do in physical. We need to create value. We need to make ourselves, I got way off on a tangent here on this. But same idea here. That's what I'm kind of going on. If when we're touching the patient and getting hands on, if we talk to them while we're touching them, we're going to give them a little bit. So that's how I got off of firm and feel and got all the way out there. That was definite squirrel moment. I'm going to pull myself back. What are the two abnormal end feels? Do you remember? Empty, okay, good. So we've got empty, and what's the other one? Spongy, or what's the other term for it? I like the other term better. Boggy, yeah. I love the term boggy, I don't know why. To me, that is just a great term. Spongy or boggy, right? It's not bogey, that was an actor. Um, so, swampy, yeah. Yeah, no problem, Kaylee. It's, it's just one of those, it's, this is one of those things that I find, you know, this is, you know, one of the reasons why when I change clinics, patients follow me. And, and I'd like to think it's because they like me and not just because they've got morbid curiosity what I'm going to do next. Right? But you guys create value like that. Patients will follow you, even as PTA. All right, so empty end feel. What is an example of an empty end feel? So you're moving me through range of motion. How would you know? Yeah. I'm like, ow, 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 stop. Right? Or I just yank my arm back down, guarding, right? So that's an empty end feel. What usually causes a boggy or a spongy end feel? Swelling, right? Severe edema, right? I'll show you a picture of somebody with severe edema then and we'll, you'll see what I mean by it causing a boggy end feel. But yeah, so that kind of that gooey feeling. So now you're moving me through biceps and you get here and you see a wave move up my bicep, right? That's when you're like, ooh, that swelling's bad, right? We're not gonna get that normal feel. It kind of boggy end feels. And the bad part is this isn't something we can really demonstrate. Well, no, actually I can, when I think about it. Um, we'll cause somebody swelling and get a tap. No, just kidding, I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> Right, but getting a really bad swelling is a boggy end feel. Some of you may have had that if you've ever sprained your ankle really bad and you're walking around on it and it feels like gushy. That would be a boggy end feel. Now, if those are abnormal end feels, that means that nowhere in the body should that be considered normal. We shouldn't ever end up in that place where those are the norms, right? Um, two other things, I, you know, now that I look at this, there's two other types of things that you might feel that might be abnormal. And now they're not end feels, but they might limit you. So rigidity versus spasticity. They may lead you to have an empty end feel, right? What is the difference between rigidity or a rigid end feel and a spastic end feel? They both classify under that empty end feel category, but these could be two different feelings you get with that. What's a rigid end feel feel like? It's gonna almost feel like they have a what type end feel? Yeah, almost like a hard end feel, bony end feel, right? And at that point, it's usually just that muscle is not going to go any farther. And it's not because it's, it's just they're, they're going to resist you no matter what. 
what happens when you get to a spastic kind of end? What's it going to feel like? So you're moving my, yeah, so you're getting this going on when you're at that end feel, right? And then you let go and the patient punches themselves in the face, right? So you're like, okay, hold on, I'm going to try to stretch out. Don't do that to your patient. That's kind of funny though, right? You do that to like your little brother. Okay, I'm going to manual muscle test your bicep. Okay, I'm going to push down three. Don't let me get to five, two. No, I never did that. I did that to like two of my classmates. No wonder they hated me. But all those, th those go under that empty end field truly because the empty end field kind of is when we're limited by something that's not normal. So we got our arthrokinna, right? This is a term to move, talk about the movement of the joint surface itself. A lot of times they're referred to as accessory motion. And that's where we get to those component movements, joint play, joint mobs, and joint manips. Those are all terms of arthrokinematic motion. So that's slide and glide. Right, or this roll, spin, glide. All of that comes into here when we're talking about this. So we've got swing or spin, right? This is the movement of a bony lever around an axis of motion. What are two joints that have a lot of swing and spin? The two big joints of the body, right? The elbow, or oh, the neck's got some too, okay. But the elbow, or not the elbow, the shoulder and the hip, right? Because they've got the, the ball and socket. The good old ball and chain joints. Then we've got roll, slide, or translation. No one uses translation. Please do not think that's actual thing. I know the book says it, but no one's like, so what is a translation of the humerus on the, you know, no one says that, no one. Combined roll, sliding in a joint, we get that kind of glide, and then we have that spin again. So all that kind of happens when it's going around. So convex concave roll, just I'm, I'm beating this horse until it is literally dead and gone. It's the basis for determining the direction of mobilizing force when joint mobilization techniques are used. Sliding is in the opposite direction of the angular movement of the bone if the moving surface is convex. Sliding is in the same direction of the moving bone if the surface is concave. So what that's saying is, if we've got a convex surface we're moving, you're gonna slide in the opposite direction of the movement you're going, and sliding is gonna happen in the same direction if we're talking about a concave surface. And that all makes sense when we mobilize for the first time in lab. So here's kind of the motion, right? We're looking at here, the we've got the femur, talk about moving around, right? So angular movement's kind of that roll, and we've got the slide to lock it in place versus here where we're going open chain almost to the knee and it's going to change. Spin, we also have the knee, we have that lock home mechanism or the screw home mechanism that also adds a little bit of spin to the knee. So here we're looking at the shoulder, there we're looking at the hip, right? And there's the good old humerus and the radius. The radius kind of moves around that rotation when we're doing pronation, supination. So joint surface positions. When the joint, joint surface is congruent, the joint surfaces have high maximum contact with each other, are tightly compressed, are difficult to distract, and are in the closed pack position. Do we ever mobilize a joint in closed pack? Good, right? Mobilizing a joint in a closed pack position ain't gonna do nothing. So when you mobilize a joint in a closed pack position, you're literally trying, you, you may try to compress it, that you could call that, I guess, a joint mobilization to try to further close off that joint, right? But why might we put a patient in the closed pack position? What does closed pack help with? Yeah, it's stability, right? It's a very, very stable surface. And because it's stable, oftentimes in that closed pack circle, what do you think happens to pain? Yeah, it reduces slightly. Usually, it's usually a little bit less, right? When you're in that position where you don't feel like that joint is unstable, not only that, but why do you think the pain reduces? Is it because of the closed pack or what can the patient probably do? Yeah, they can relax, right? They're not having to hold that arm 
because they're so worried about it dropping out of socket, right? That they get in that closed kind of closed pack position, like, oh, okay. Okay, I can relax a little bit. And so they're not guarding as much, right? Why might we put a patient in the closed pack position before we mobilize them? Well, exactly this, right? What if I put them in a closed pack position for a few minutes and just do a little bit of vibration where I'm not actually mobilizing it. I'm just kind of relaxing this joint, right? If I kind of relax them in that position and then I move them to the open pack, I might get greater mobilization because now the patient's less likely to guard against what I'm doing. And I will say like you say stuff like thrust manipulation, right? Or just manipulation. And that kind of starts putting a scary face on the patient, right? They're kind of like, what are you talking about, right? I find that just saying mobilization is a little better. I'm gonna mob your joint a little bit, move it around. That sets them a little bit at ease and saying, I'm gonna thrust that joint can do what? Right? We're, we're back to the whole, uh, what do you call it? Patients bridging on the table. In all other positions, the joint surfaces are incongruent, right? Where they're not matching up. You can have open pack or loose pack position. Again, no one that I know uses loose packed, except when I was in Denmark, they did use loose packed. Um, but it wasn't loose packed, it was their term for loose packed. And then resting position, kind of the, where you're at. So let's say I lay you down in bed and I tell you to relax completely. I lay you supine. Describe, think to yourself right now, what does your body automatically do when you're laying on your back and you rest? And what hap think of the joints of your body. What about your shoulders? What do they kind of do? Do they retract a little bit? right? Because your scapula is going to go down and try to meet the bed, right? Knees kind of just straighten out, but they're not completely straight, right? If you think about it, when you're in bed, your knees may not be solidly locked in extension. They're kind of in that maybe five degrees of flexion, kind of just unlocked. They're not in the screw home mechanism. What about your ankles? What happened to your ankles when you're in bed and you're relaxing? They, the feet stay straight up, right? No, they typically rotate whichever way you're kind of uh, biased towards, whether you're antiversion or retroversion. And they may go a little bit everted, right? So feet just kind of drop out, right? And it's pretty rare that you lay in anatomical position as well. No one lays like this, right? It just depends upon what you're doing. Your body just kind of relaxes. And that can tell you a lot about a patient because then you can see where their relaxed position is. You lay like this. I tend to lay like this when I'm in bed. And my bed's a coffin too, but I'm just kidding. How did they know that, uh, how did they know that Dracula had COVID? Because of his coffin. You may free, be, feel free to use that. So the most suitable for joint mobilizations we've talked about multiple, multiple times, right? The open packed position is the most suitable for joint mobilizations versus joint stabilizations is that closed pack, that locked off position. So, Stretching versus joint stretch, light stretching, right? Passive angular stretching may cause increased pain or joint trauma, right? So sometimes if we really stretch out the capsule, like so if I've got a problem with my posterior capsule, right? So the back side of my shoulder, I can stretch that capsule by pulling me all the way through flexion and kind of getting up here. I can get some of that stretched out. Now eventually I'll compress it again. But I can get that lower portion of my capsule stretch out I can get the superior portion stretched out like that. But if you move me through that full range of motion in order to get that joint capsule moving, a lot of times it's gonna be a painful motion. So you're not gonna be able to get the patient there to get that stretch, right? So if we're talking about mobilizing that joint capsule, in order to get that full stretch of that joint capsule in a traditional stretch, patients aren't oftentimes gonna let you get to it because of pain. 
They want to avoid those conditions or those positions at all costs because it hurts, right? Joints, the glide slides mobilizations usually are a little bit better for those patients because again, you're not doing a gross movement of the whole joint. You're doing just motions of that capsule, right? It's, and it can be very controlled. It replicates normal joint mechanics, which we'll talk, we'll see when we do some of the joint mobs. And the force is very specific to the targeted tissue, right? If I'm working on that posterior capsule in my shoulder, so if I've got a posterior capsule problem, what direction do you think you're going to mobilize me? So the backside of my arm's my problem, you're going to mobilize me which way to stretch it out? Anterior, right? And you may add a little bit of superior inferior motion with it as well, depending upon the structure of the capsule that's tight, right? So usually if you've got part of the capsule that's tight, you're gonna mobilize it in the opposite direction of the part of the capsule that's damaged, or not damaged, but tight. So, you know, if I've got a lateral capsule issue, I may move it medial. If I've got a medial capsule issue, I might move it lateral, right? So that's kind of the thought process we're doing. It allows you to specifically target that tissue. So compression is where we get those two joint surfaces when we get them approximated, right? So I like to think of compression as if you take your hand, right? Does anyone ever do this? They've got kind of a sore neck and they put their hands on their head and they kind of push down. And honestly, for me doing this, just doing this relieves a lot of pain in my neck, right? because what I'm doing is squishing down and kind of giving me a little bit more of a congruent surface and I can relax a little bit more. The downside to that is I'm squishing my discs, right? Or what discs that I have left. Traction or longitudinal pull is where we pull on that joint to separate out. Now traditional traction we think of is spinal traction, right? And we even learned with spinal traction, or I hope you, I, I actually, cause we didn't really do the, class on this, right? I may break this out to talk about this with this lecture. Um, actually, I think I will. With spinal traction, because we didn't get to go to a clinic to see this, with spinal traction, when you have person, a person set up on spinal traction, especially with the mechanical devices, like the actual big machines for spinal traction, the angle of pull will affect what area of the spine you're affecting, right? So, as you increase that angle of the pull of the cord, you can either move further up the spine or further down the spine. But not only that, the position you put the patient in can affect what you're specifically separating out. So if you put them in you know, a more prone position, you might be kind of stretching out and closing off that back side of the spine, but you're opening up the front, which is usually the way we want to suck those discs anyway, right? Sometimes you might kind of do a little bit of rotation with it to open up one of the sides of the spine. Yeah. I, how many of you guys have seen prone traction with spinal traction? Never? Yeah, it's the only traction I do. When I set a patient up on, or as long as I can, right? If they've got, you know, belly, I can't really sit on prone traction. But if I do traction, I honestly prefer to put them in prone because it actually opens up the windows a little better for me. And not only that, but I find that the patients like it better once they've done it two or three times that way. It's a little weird the first time, but then after you kind of relax to it, you know, and obviously you can't do prone traction of the head. That would be really silly because your face would be down in that mat and wouldn't work out very well. But prone traction works out really well because it's changing the actual direction of pull. So distraction or separation of joint surfaces, joint traction or joint separation. Let's say I broke my femur. Let's not say break my femur. Let's say I have a problem with my hip. My problem is maybe that I'm going in for hip surgery. And the doc sends an order down to PT. The patient comes in maybe on a Monday night. And the doc sends an order down to PT and tells them to do traction, longitudinal traction on the hip for two hours. So we have to set up, a, then we do have joint, we have traction machines to set up for that. But why do you think he's pulling on that joint for those two hours? Well, he's getting that whole stretch reflex working, right? So that maybe when they go in to do the surgery, 
those muscles are already kind of fatigued from fighting that stretch for so long that they're relaxed and he can get through the muscles a little bit easier. Right? We can also be trying to pull the weight, the joints apart so that further fracture doesn't occur, so further compression doesn't occur. So there's all kinds of reasons why we might do longitudinal extraction. So there's compressing force, obviously pushing the joints together. There's some traction forces, right? And distraction off, so traction is moving in a direction, whereas distraction is kind of moving it out. And a lot of times if we do that kind of distraction on the shoulder, for some patients that feels really good and it helps with the pain. But for other patients, because that shoulder is so sensitive, you do that distraction force and pull it away from the congruent surfaces and they just don't like it because they can't relax enough to let you do that. So you might have to think of other methods of doing it. Turn off your car alarm, please. So effects of motion. It helps move that synovial fluid to maintain cartilage health. So the more we can kind of mobilize, mobilize those joints, we can kind of get that fluid moving around in those joints, right? So that's whenever you have somebody that complains about you cracking your knuckles, say, well, look, I'm just trying to mobilize my syn synovial fluid in my joints. It helps maintain extensibility and tensile strength of the articular and periarticular tissue. So all the stuff in the actual joint and around the joint. And it provides sensory input for proprioceptive feedback. It can be for balance response, but it can also just be for pain relief. There's something about that pop when they're doing grade fives or when they're doing manipulations, there's something about that pop. Just think about it. When you pop your joints, there's something about that. that you're like, oh, that's good. Right? It's just, you get that feeling. I'd be curious if somebody maybe did a study and mobilized people's spines, but didn't actually get a pop going, but made the sound. Somehow or other had a little device that when they push, you got that pop sound. I'd be curious if the patient would have the same relief. I wonder, I, I often, I've thought about that before. I wonder if you just somehow art artificially made the sound, if it would make a patient feel better. And if so, then why don't we just sit and make popping sounds all day long? I don't know. So indications, why might we do joint mobilizations? Well, if we have pain, muscle guarding, and spasm, we can do it as long as it's not gonna in impact with guarding, right? There is a neurophysiological effect doing these motions, right? There's a response that our brain gives to mobilizations because we're moving in the plane of motion. Mechanical effects, moving around that synovial fluid, gliding those surfaces so that the actual articular cartilage is moving all happens, right? It helps us reverse hypo mobility or the lack of movements. It helps us correct positional faults or subluxations, right? So if I've got a shoulder that's subluxed inferiorly, if I mobilize it superiorly, I can help get that joint back to where it needs to be and work on it. Um, progressive limitations, where they're starting slowly but surely declining, such as like ALS or muscular dystrophy, again, within reasons and with the PT thing, within the PT guidelines, you might mobilize those joints in order to keep that progressive limitation from getting totally worse. And then functional immobility, where, you know, maybe the problem's not that the, it's all joint capsule, maybe they just don't have nerves going to that muscle anymore to move that shoulder. So now that'd be a functional. Yeah, Dylan, right? It'd be interesting to see if that would work. Limitations. We cannot change the disease process. So like the case, in the case of like an ALS patient, maybe I'm gonna do some joint mobs on their shoulder. Just because I do joint mobs in the shoulder does not stop ALS from progressing it makes that time period a little bit better for their motion, but it's not gonna stop the ALS. ALS is gonna go on no matter what, right? So if we have you know, something breaking down in that joint, we're not gonna be able to stop the breakdown, but maybe help lessen the effect of it. Can't change the inflammatory per process, right? If we have a really, really bad inflammation going on in that joint, can't stop it, right? The only way we can stop that is by changing the way we do things. And then the skills of the therapist affect the outcome. This was actually a study they did. And it was interesting because they did a couple different variations on this study. And they also showed the outward confidence of the therapist. And again, when we talk PT or PTA, it doesn't matter. The outward confidence of the PT or PTA in doing the joint mobilizations, even if they did them not necessarily correctly, 
the patients got better results. So if the therapist knew exactly what they're doing and did the most appropriate joint mobilizations, the patient got better. If the therapist didn't know what they were doing and did the improper, well, go figure. They didn't get as good of a result. They still got some results, but they didn't get as good of a result. And then also if the therapist came in, maybe didn't do the best thing in the world, didn't do the right exact motion, but man, they were talking about it, talking about how this is going to help and, you know, had the confidence to it, the patient got better, right? Because again, patients like people coming in and knowing what they're doing. Okay. It's just, that's just the way it is. You know, that's why you go to a physical therapist for care, not to your buddy, Paul down the road that read a story online or watched a YouTube video. So contraindications, hyper mobility. If the joint is super, super, super hypermobile and already is loosey goosey, you don't wanna make that worse by mobilizing the joint. Severe joint effusion, you get swelling in the actual joint itself. Well, then we gotta figure out why they've got swelling and joint mobilizations when you've had that real bad swelling is not gonna help. Inflammation, so they're in an acute inflamed state. Now there are some joint mobs we can do, right? But again, that's gonna be up to the PT to decide if we actually do them. We're not gonna just jump on them immediately. And then irreversible hyper, hyper, hypermobility. What would be an, irrever yeah, an irreversible change in the shoulder that would limit the motion? What would make the shoulder hypermobile that would be irreversible and you couldn't change. Yeah, dislocation, good, right? What about if I suddenly got, I break off the acromion and now the acromion stuck in the actual glenohumeral joint? That would be a pretty much irreversible change from the outside. We'd probably do some surgery and fix it, right? But you wouldn't wanna, if you got the tip of the acromion stuck in that joint space, you don't wanna go, hey, you know what? I got a good idea. Let's go ahead and posterior mobilize that joint. Right? Or maybe the joints fuse, like my neck. You wouldn't want to do mobilizations or even traction on my neck at that level that I have a fusion. Because think about it, I've got those pins sticking in, right? So I've got those two pins. Now you start pulling me, right? Maybe you get some motion going up top here. Maybe you have some motion going down bottom here. Now you're pulling those surfaces away from the pin and you can actually cause the screws to slip. And that would be bad. Uh, conditions requiring special precautions, malignancy, right? If a patient has cancer, we have to be careful. Doesn't mean we can't do joint mobs, right? Let's say the patient has cancer of the lungs. Does that mean we, right, just in the area, because that's what I was getting at right now, Renee, good job. Good, you're right there with me, I like it, right? So can't, patients got cancer of the lungs, does that mean we can't mobilize the ankle? No, we can probably mobilize the ankle. It's gonna be a PT decision, right? Because they're gonna make that decision to do it. But we may even be cautious then because the cancer could have done what? What's it called when it spreads? What's that M word? Metastasis, right? Yeah, so this, did you guys talk about the TMN rating for tumors in patho? So, T, M, T, M, N. Did you guys talk about that in patho? Do you remember? For cancer, right? Where T is the number of what? T is the number of active Tumors, good, right? What's the M stand for? We just talked about the word. Metastasis. I can't spell it. Stasis, there we go. Stasis, there we go. Right? Has it metastasized, right? How many, and then there's going to be a number behind that. How much it's spread, right? If it's malignant too. And then N is what? What's the N for this one? Nodes, right? 
how many lymph nodes is affected, right? So if you've got something where you've got something like this, right, you've got a one zero zero and that's, you're looking at lung cancer and you want to mobilize the ankle, would it be okay to probably mobilize the ankle there? Yeah, right? But now let's change that up. And now that's your numbers. Would that put a thought process on maybe not mobilizing them? Yeah, no bueno, right? I would be really hesitant to mobilize the patient's joint even at that point, even though it's distal and distant from the actual area of the initial tumor, right? We've got 10 metastasized sites and we've got four nodes affected. That tells the cancer is where in the body. Yeah, everywhere, right? And at that point, we still may mobilize because at that point, it may just be comfort, right? But that's going to be a PT decision. But that kind of gives you the idea, right? You know, you really don't want one of these. That's the one you really don't want. Right, because at that point, that's pretty terminal, right? There's no way they could get rid of that. And what did you learn? What causes cancer in patho? What did you learn causes the cancer? Here's what I like to say that causes cancer. Yeah. That causes cancer, right? Everything can cause cancer, but certain things have a higher cause of increasing your chances of getting cancer, right? Eating processed meats, your lunch meats. I don't know if you guys realize this or not, but the WHO actually put out a thing a few years ago that showed that eating lunch meats or deli meats is as high of a carcinogen risk as smoking cigarettes. So processed meats. Mmm. So, you know, going to Jimmy John's or... Yeah, well, I just look at it. I'm just trying to speed my own along. That's all. Um, well, that's a good idea. Why are some of the countries probably not as bad as us with cancer? Well, I think probably their medical approach, right? Again, we are reactive to our therapy or reactive to our medical care versus proactive. That's probably, there's less processed sugars and there's less processed food in general, right? Um, they did, there was a whole study about looking at the obesity rates in Japan. And Japan used to, you know, Japan used to have a strict law on no high fructose corn syrup, right? They used to not allow high fructose corn syrup in food. That the only types of sugar you could have in your food is just, you know, cane sugar, like regular fruit sugar, stuff like that. But now that they've allowed high fructose corn syrup into their food market, guess what's happening to obesity? It's on the rise. Now, does that mean high fructose corn syrup is evil? Well, I mean, maybe. Right. Well, actually, they're, they're, their obesity is on the rise, heavily enough, right? So diet's a big play of it, right? Countries that have a diet of seafoods and more fresh vegetables like the Scandinavian countries have healthier overall functional climate or uh, functional life and are at lower risk for cancer. But also, you know, causation, does, co or correlation doesn't equal causation because maybe the other reason they're not seeing a lot, like Denmark, maybe the other reason they don't see, why do you think Denmark doesn't see Denmark, England, Sweden, why do you think they don't see a high rate of skin cancer in those areas? Anyone ever, yeah, there's not a lot of sun, right? And not only that, but when there is sun, it's usually overcast, gray, and rainy, right? I'd probably, yeah, I'd probably guess if you looked at the, relate, the rates of skin cancer in the United States, if you talk about the Pacific Northwest, I'm guessing probably the skin cancer rates in the Pacific Northwest are less than maybe, say, Southern California. 
right? We're not even getting into the SoCal lifestyle, right? We do love to be tan, right? GTL. So there's all kinds of reasons why they could have different cancer rates than us, right? And just our lifestyle in general. Let's face it, we can't get people to wear masks. Like seriously, we can't get them to wear masks. We're not gonna stop them from going out and burning themselves to a crisp on the beach. It's not gonna happen. I don't know what's wrong with our country. I wish I knew. It's a great country, but man, we've just kind of weird. Um, bone disease detectable on a radiograph, right? So if you notice that they've got severe osteoporosis or severe osteopenia, um, not gonna wanna do joint mobilizations. Unhealed fracture. I should hopefully not have to say this, but if the patient's got a broken bone, don't mobilize it. Like, I, I, I don't know why I have to say that. I think about that for a time and go, we have to say that now because somewhere, some person tried to do mobilizations on a broken humeral head. And so now we have, it's kind of like the caution coffee may be hot. Right, I just don't understand it. I just don't. Now, what if I've got a non-union fracture where maybe I broke my humerus and my humerus has slid on the anterior aspect of itself. So they're kind of laying over each other. Well, then we're actually gonna do some joint mobilizations in order to realign those bones. That's why it says within limitations. There are some mobilizations we'll do to fix fractures that cause a union of the fracture. But that's not something you guys are going to do, right? That's not some, there's no way, PT is not going to be called down to the operating room, you know, PT to operating, PTA to operating room 304, please, to realign a fracture. No, we don't get called for that, right? That's, the doc's going to, maybe a PT might, but it's pretty rare the docs are just going to do it. And then hypermobility in the associated joint. So let's say that we're going, we want to mobilize the elbow but that ra the radio ulnar joints are really, really, really super hypermobile. We're probably not gonna mobilize that elbow as much because we have a likely risk of injuring that inter osseous joint between the two bones. So if you've got hypermobility in the associated joints, we're gonna be careful as well. Conditions for thinking about this, right? Total joint replacements. Eh, we're gonna watch doing mobilizations on those. We know the structural integrity is good, but it's maybe not something we're going to necessarily mobilize. Newly formed or weakened connective tissue. You've got a really bad kind of what we call gossamer scar, that really kind of thin, frail looking scar on the front of your shoulder. We may really think about not mobilizing that shoulder in a direction that's going to stretch that scar out because we run the risk of opening that scar up. And then the elderly, right? Let's think about it. You know, little Millie comes in and she's complaining about her low back. And she's like, oh my, oh my, oh my, Emily, my low back, it's really been bugging me. And the PT is like, don't worry, I'm going to do grade five thrust mobs on her. Is that probably the best idea? Right, the PT goes up and line, yeah, lines up on the spine. And I so, okay, Millie, get ready, whack. And all of a sudden, Millie's like, oh, my back feels so much better, but am I supposed to be able to feel my feet? Because I don't feel my feet anymore. Right, because we may have done the fracture of the spine. It's not something we're gonna do necessarily with an elderly person. But maybe the shoulder? But again, that's gonna be one of those where it's a true PT decision if we do it. And usually when we get those patients that are elderly, most of the time, we're only gonna mobilize them as grade ones, maybe grade twos. Um, I only mean about threes and fours, but we're not going to mobilize them very much. So when we're looking at these joint mobilizations, first thing the PT has to evaluate them. So they take quality of pain, they look to see if they've got a capsular pattern, and then make sure that there's no subluxation or dislocation before we do this mobilizations. Now let's say you're working with John. John's a patient that's got some shoulder motion, range of motion issues. And the PT 
you know, is, is just not having luck figuring out what's going on with that shoulder. So he orders general exercises. There's no mobilizations in there. And John's been coming for four to six weeks. Nothing's getting better. And you're like, when you're moving around with that patient, you're like, man, this looks like it's an anterior capsule problem. I'm not sure if it is, but man, it looks like it. Does that mean that, can you go to the PT and say, hey, you know, can we try some joint mobilizations? Is that okay to do? Yeah, it is, right? Now we're not gonna go tell the PT we're gonna do joint, okay, going, you know, Dr. Reskin, I've decided I'm gonna do joint mobilization. So put that in the plan of care, right? But we can go and say, hey, you know, I've been noticing that the patient's got a little bit, little bit more range of motion limitation in this direction, this direction. It really is screaming at me that it's a posterior capsule issue. What do you think about doing some joint mobs? And then, you know, if you have a good PT, that's when you guys will sit down and kind of toss pros and cons back and forth and go, well, it could be this, but could we also injure this doing this and that? Oh, no, I don't think we're going to injure this and this, that. And then once the PT gives us our blessing, go, okay, yeah, go do some joint mobs. We're going to say, well, that's a PT only skill and I'm not going to do it. Well, no, I mean, depends on where you're at, right? Because officially, again, by the APTA rulings, we can't do joint mobilizations. That's the, I'll bring up the, the thing on that in a little bit. So here's the APTA clinical guidelines. Interventions exclusively performed by the physical therapist include interventions that require immediate and continuous examination and evaluations throughout the intervention, right? Such procedural interventions with the scope of physical therapist practice are performed exclusively by the PT include, but are not limited to, spinal and peripheral joint mobilizations manipulations, which are components of manual therapy and selective sharps debridement, which is a component of wound management. So this, does anyone know what HOD stands for? Hold door, hold door. Because you'll see this a lot when you see APTA rulings. It's House of Delegates. So what do you think the House of Delegates is with the APTA? Yeah, this is our bureaucratic side of the APTA. So let me tell you a little bit about this because taking a deep breath. House of Delegates is a really good idea. It allows us once a year, they meet, they convene a session and each state has two representatives. So every state has two House of Delegates representatives, right? They're usually elected by the NVAPTA to represent the state of Nevada. They usually work in conjunction with the Board of Nevada. Now they're not part of the Board of Nevada, but they work in conjunction with them. Each state has one vote in the House of Delegates. So if there's a new law that's being proposed, every state has a chance to vote on that law. Then each section of the APTA has votes. So what would be an, do you guys learn about, do you guys remember to learn about sections in PTA 103? What are, what would be an example of a section of the APTA? Does anyone know? I have an idea. So when you think of sections, think of groupings of therapy. So there's a pediatric section. There's an acute care section. There is a AAOMS, the Academy of Manual Specialties, right? Um, there is craniosacral. There's an orthopedic section. There's a pelvic floor section. So each of those sections has a vote, okay? So do you see how we're starting to build up a lot of votes here, right? Each state has a vote. Each section has a vote. And then we get down to PTAs. Does anyone know how many votes PTAs get? One. Does anyone know what we had about two years ago? Three years ago? We had half of a vote. So we've got one vote now. 
But let's think about this for a second. What are the chances we can get this law changed with one vote? Not much, right? That's the thing that kind of, this is the downside to it. So that one vote represents all physical therapist assistants across the country. And I was part of that PTA caucus. And I'm going to tell you, each state has a PTA caucus rep. The PTA caucus then has to meet as a whole. So 50, no, actually, it's because you got a, you've got a Guam rep, you've got a, a Puerto Rico rep. So 50 plus representatives from across the country have got to get together as a PTA caucus in order to agree upon our one vote. So yeah, it, it's a bureaucratic kind of nightmare is kind of what I'm getting at. But the PTs, when you think about it, how many votes do they have? Think about that for a second. Yeah, they have 50 votes across the states, plus each of their sections has a vote. So if you're part of the AOMT, the manual therapist section and the pediatric section, now you've got 50 plus two votes, right? But we've got one. I don't, I don't completely believe that's 100% fair. That's not fair and accurate representation. And so because of that, what do you think the rate of PTAs being members of the APTA is? Do you think there are a lot of PTA members of the APTA? No. Does anyone know how many there are, how many PTA members are in the state of Nevada right now? And we want to take a guess. So I'll tell you there are, I think, 972 PTA licensed in Nevada. I want to say it was 972. Don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure that was close to it. So Kelly says 150 members are the APTA or PTAs. Anyone else have another vote? Okay, we got 20. We have 50. There are five now. Yeah, so there are five members. There's myself. And so we have an adjunct faculty. I don't know if you guys have met Mr. Gersh yet. Have you guys met Mr. Gersh yet? I don't know if he's been in to meet you guys yet. Okay, so you met Mr. Gersh, right? So there's me and Mr. Gersh. Dr. Chima is still a member here in the state of Nevada. So once she fully moves out of the state of Nevada, we'll lose that one, right? So three of them were represented at Pima, and then so that means there are two others. Right? Well, why do PTAs only? Because that we've got one vote. So what do you think PTAs feel? Because I, I was the PTA caucus rep for a while, and I know what they feel, because I had to talk to them. And man, that was not a fun talk. Yeah, there's no point to it. You're not going to represent me anyway. Right? So th this here, here's an excellent example of it saying PTAs can't do joint mobilizations. I'm not saying they're wrong, but I'm saying we need to have a discussion about this at least, and there's no discussion going on about it because PTAs are underrepresented, right? And our lucky, our PTA caucus, I will say, do, does not only the state, but in general, we do a lot of working with the other caucuses in order to get something pushed PTA-wise. But we've just got such a small vote that the APTA almost considers us inconsequential. Right? Our one vote is not going to change. You know, I know that people always say that one vote makes a difference. The one vote only makes a difference if it's a 50-50 split. Right? But very rarely is a one vote going to make a difference. Now, when we talked about electoral colleges, yeah, that one vote can make a difference. I'm not even going to get into that. But yeah, you know, we don't have much of a representation. So according again, here, this is why PTAs don't feel they're very valued, is because here we are saying PTA shouldn't be able to do stuff. Now, I'm going to openly admit, 
for Sharps debridement, I'm actually okay with that. I really don't want to have to do Sharps debridement. I'm going to be 100% honest. I don't want to be responsible for cutting into a patient. With my wound care training I'm going to give you guys, I'm not going to have enough time to teach you how to do proper sharps debridement. So PTs can have that. But I don't think joint mobilizations are out of our range of practice, but whatever. And almost no state listens to this, but I'm just going to tell you that flat out. So oscillation techniques. Oscillation means what? I'm oscillating right now. fancy way of saying bounce, right? Yeah, moving, right? So we're going to go through these. I'm going to talk through them, and then we're going to review the kind of what they are again. So grade one, small amplitude at beginning of range and is good for pain inhibition and fluid movement. Grade two, large amplitude within range. Those, again, pain inhibition and fluid movement. Grade threes are large amplitude up to the limit into resistance. You get a little bit of a stretch. Grade fours are large amplitude at the limit into resistance. We get a stretch, right? And what you're going to see is we have, when you talk about these, here's our non oscillation mean if we're going like this, right? Up and down, 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 up and down. These are non thrust sustained. Right? So this is where we start getting into stuff like distraction. So small amplitude, a small amount of distraction, very low amplitude. Amplitude is that waveform, right? Grade two, we get to the area of tight tissue and stop. Grade three, we get to the area of tight tissue and we stretch into it. So this is kind of looking at this. So this is the difference between an oscillation technique and a joint place stretch technique. Most of the times when you're dealing with a joint mobilizations and you hear somebody traditionally talk about joint mobilizations, they're talking about this over here. We don't talk about this very often, right? Because this is where we get into traction. And I'll tell you, Dr. Reskin is really diehard that she feels that when we, when we start talking about these type of joint mobilizations, these are not for PT or PTAs. So like traction of the spine. If it's mechanical traction, okay for PTAs to do it. If you're doing manual traction, she really doesn't feel that PTA should do traction of the spine or the neck. Again, I'm not going to argue one way or the other. I've done traction, manual traction, because I had a PT that trusted me. But some PTs just don't feel that's within the scope of practice of PTA. And this is where we get into that argument of what's in our scope, what's are not. So let's talk about the oscillation techniques first, right? So what I want you to do is take one of your hands and find either your chair or something soft to push into, whether it's your leg, your leg's okay as well, right? What I want you to do is take your palm and I want you to press down until you can't press down anymore. So that you can kind of feel where that end range is. And then let off. Okay, so a grade one mobilization. Let me tilt the camera down a little bit. A grade one mobilization. Here's my, my surface, right? I felt down to feel where the end range is, and I come off. A grade one, I'm literally at that beginning range of motion, and I'm just bouncing. So I'm not doing hardly anything. So put your hand on that soft surface, and just literally move the tissue slightly. All you're doing is barely anything at all, right? That's a grade one mobilization. Now, grade two, we're going to go through that range of motion, but we're going to stop before you get to that end. So now we're a little bit larger of an amplitude motion. And we may not come the whole way back to starting position, right? So now we're getting that. That's a grade two. A grade three, we're going to go down until we find that range of motion. We're going to kind of push into it, right? So we're going all the way back to kind of mid-range, all the way into that resistance. And then a grade four, we're going to go to that resistance, and we're going to oscillate into that resistance. 
So we're not coming all the way back to midline. We're literally at that resistance edge and just oscillating in there. Those are the types of mobilizations. So now we're going to actually do one. So what I want you to do, do you guys remember what open pack position of the knee was? About what range of flexion? About how many degrees, you remember? About 20 to 30 degrees of flexion. All right, so get your knee there and I want you to relax your knee. So once you kind of get a little bit of bend going on the knee, relax the knee. Take your fingers, locate the inferior aspect of your patella, patella and the superior aspect of the patella. So far, are we all in agreement? We doing okay? Now, once you've got both sides of that patella, slide your patella up and you go back to where you started. I want you to find where that patella can't move anymore. So you got an idea. We're gonna do a grade one mode to start. Grade one, you're literally just gonna sit where you're starting and oscillate just very lightly. So just a little bit of motion going on. I'm barely contracting my muscles on my hand to move it. That's a grade one. Grade two, now we're gonna start at that starting position, go almost to the end range and then back. Right now I'm getting a little bit more motion. I don't know if you can see my patella moving or not, but it's moving around there pretty good. Right? Grade three, we're going to go start about midway and go all the way into that range of motion, stretch a little. That's a little uncomfortable. Stretch a little bit and come back out. And then grade four, we're going to go all the way to that end range and oscillate in the, at that end range now. And a lot of times I do a a grip where I pull right to the end range. Did everyone feel their patella moving a little bit? Does it feel a little weird? Right? That's kind of one of the modes that you're expected to be able to do as a PTA. I guarantee most of our clinics that you go to for um, for PTA, for being a student, will expect to be able to do joint mobilizations of the kneecap. So it's a really common thing to do, especially post, you know, knee surgery, is to mobilize that kneecap. Yep, we're going to, yep. All right. Does that make sense so far? We'll talk about the stretching, we'll take a break and come back. Let's, let me get up, I'm gonna pause my Recording here, so we're going to take a break here real quick. So let's this is a video that I found that does a pretty good job of explaining those mobilization points. And they use sponges, which I should really just get some sponges and use this to demonstrate it. That would be too smart. So I'll let the, the guy explain here. Today we're going to be showing you the Maitland grades for mobilization. The metal pole represents a bone, such as the humerus. The orange sponge represents the joint capsule and the yellow sponge represents connective tissue surrounding the joint capsule. Grade one, small amplitude, low velocity, no barrier. You get a serious voice crack there. Grade two, large amplitude, low velocity, no barrier. Grade three, large amplitude, low velocity, up to the barrier. Grade four, small amplitude, low velocity, at the barrier. Grade five, specific manipulation through the barrier, high velocity, low amplitude thrust. Cancel. They weren't, the sponges weren't wet, they were moist. All 
don't know what it is. Uh, for some reason, students have a problem every time. Because I use that term a lot when we do wound care. Like, you got to have a nice, warm, moist wound care environment. Okay, so that was talking about the, so here, you heard him say Maitland. Maitland's just one of the guys that kind of standardized it. Pretty much, we always talk about Maitland. So that's kind of going into those, when we talk about those oscillation techniques. Now we talk about something like a sustained joint stretch or sustained joint play technique. We're now talking about traction, right? So we're talking about these type of traction ideas, a grade one traction you're only literally coming out just a slight bit and pulling on it. So I'm only coming, so I'm literally just doing a little bit like that to distract it and get some range going. A lot of times I'm just gonna go there and stop, go there and hold, go there and hold. A grade two, I'm gonna go to the point where I find resistance and stop. I can't really, hold on, now you get this way. So go to the point where I find resistance and stop. Right? And then grade three, I'm going to go to that resistance, right? There's a resistance and I'm going to stretch into it. So in this case, grades one in the stretch technique is a very low amplitude. Grades two and three are a little bit greater amplitudes. So again, I'm putting FYI on this chart because this is for your information only. Understand we do not do high velocity thrust or thrust manipulations. These are small amplitude, high velocity. They're only performed once. We should not be walking up and down, constantly popping that same area, right? Once you get, kind of get that snap, you're done, right? So it's gonna be a quick pop, right? So that type of motion, boom, boom. Boom, boom. It's gonna be a very, very high velocity motion. Now, in order to do this, the patient has to relax, right? They can't be tight and guarding the whole time they're doing this high velocity motion because if they guard during it, it's gonna injure them, right? That's why if any of you have ever had a chiropractor manipulate your back or anything like that, they'll tell you to take a deep breath in and exhale and relax. And then they'll do the thrust because they've got to reduce the amount of tissue tension they have in order to actually get that um, motion going on. Now there are all kinds of techniques for doing these manipulations. Um, you know, the traditional back pop is where you have them prone and you kind of pop down. There's a twisting technique where you bring the lower body across and the upper body the other way and you pop that way. There's the over the back technique, which is one I tend to like, I, where you hook arms and then the person that's actually doing the mobilization for you kind of leans forward and rolls you up their spine. Um, there's all kinds of techniques for that. But again, it's not something we are supposed to be trained in. It is indicated for snap adhesions where we got stuff that's stuck down that we might have to pop or when we have to realign joint surfaces. I talked briefly about a pelvic shotgun before. The pelvic shotgun is a high velocity thrust manipulation where we use to realign the pelvis and get rid of incongruencies in the pelvis. So when we're applying these joint mobilizations, the first thing that's important is their position and stabilization. So if I have a patient and I'm working on the shoulder and I wanna do something like a posterior mobilizations, I probably want them laying supine. It's not as easy to do mobilizations when I'm sitting up because I'm going to have an active amount of muscles eccentrically resisting gravity. So if I lay the person down, their shoulders kind of relax back and now I can mobilize that joint. It was a little harder for me to mobilize my kneecap when I was sitting here because even actively sitting, your quads kind of resisting gravity slightly, right? It's a little bit better to have them lying down where their knees kind of relax and maybe a bolster under the knee so they feel supported. The direction and target treatment force is gonna be determined by the target plane. If we're going to stretch the anterior capsule, we're gonna stretch it posteriorly, but go in a unidirectional manner. We're not gonna go angular or round or anything like that. We're gonna go straight in that nice line. Just like stretching, 
once we initiate and do the treatment, so once we do those mobilizations, we need to actively then have them work within those mobilizations. So if we've got the shoulder, we've, we've uh, mobilized it and got a little bit more play in that joint, immediately after the mobilizations, we should be doing exercises to utilize that new range of motion. Because if we just get it going and don't do anything to use it, they'll lose it. It's that specificity of training type idea, the said principle, right? If we don't have them move into that new range of motion and actively do contractions in that new range of motion, they'll pretty well lose it. We have to, or we have to kind of document patient response, right? Not all patients are going to like mobilizations. Um, I've had some patients that really love them and they'll, they'll come in and they'll be like, can you do that bouncing thing? That, that the last therapist did that bouncing thing for me. And I'm like, bouncing thing? What are you talking about? You know, where they put their hand on my shoulder and just kind of bouncing back and forth. Okay. Well, I don't think it'll really help you, right? And there are indications and contraindications for it. And it's only part of the total program. Patients should not be coming into therapy only to have joint mobilizations, right? Now think about that from a chiropractor standpoint. Does that happen? Yeah, right? Why do you keep having to go back though? Well, just think about what I just said. If you go, you get cracked, right? It's not a permanent fix, right? So you go, you get cracked and you don't do anything to use that new improved range of motion. In a day or two, you're back to where you were. And so then you're calling the chiropractor back up and going, yeah, I need that adjustment. And you go in, right? And I remember this, I, back in, yeah, I'm not gonna give the year, Never mind. Um, back in the day, I was in a, um, a semi-professional martial arts tournament. And I did the most cardinal sin you can ever do as a martial artist in a, in a match. I went to do a spinning kick without knowing where my target was. Well, I knew where he was, but I didn't get them back away from me before I did a spinning kick. And when I started moving through my motions, the guy did a front kick right to my, where he thought was my gut, but at that point was now my low back. And I caught the ball of his foot right at my pelvic crest. And it was right on the spine. And man, that messed me up for a good, probably three weeks. I had a really, really, really bad back strain. And of course, you know, my dad was like, well, let's go to the chiropractor. A chiropractor helps me in construction all the time. So I went to the chiropractor and I'd go there twice a week. And I'd usually go before martial arts practice and I'd feel great for martial arts practice. And then a day later, I'm back to pain. And I, you know, until I went to see somebody for physical therapy for it and actually started strengthening the muscles around the area that was injured, I didn't get better. I just have, had to keep going. And at one point I was going three times a week because it was the only way I could function, right? And when I say they literally sell you crack, they literally sell you crack, right? They get you that crack sound and that kind of causes that psychosomatic feeling and you feel better. Now, does that mean that the mobilization also doesn't do anything? No, the mobilization does. But again, when you do that mobilization, if you don't use that new range of motion, it doesn't do much. And my chiropractor would do double down because they do the cracking and then they'd put me on IFC for an hour. I'm sure that was billing my insurance company a pretty penny back then, right? But they did nothing really to improve my condition. And then I went to physical therapy and man, I hated my physical therapist. Because he had me doing all these weird things where I'm like bridging up in the air and doing pelvic thrusts and doing pelvic rotations and doing a lot of bending over and touching my toes and bending over and touching my toes and extending back. And man, I was sore after physical therapy. I was never sore after chiropractic therapy. But what I found is I got better overall. And I told the therapist, well, you know, I said, I, I felt really good when he did those pops. And so the therapist is like, okay, I'll do them. I'm like, you can do them too? Yeah. It's not a, and so he did them because it helped me feel better. And it did do a little bit of mobilization in my spine, but then I used that new motion I gained and I got better fairly quick. But I spent months just going to the chiropractor going, why does, I'm not gonna be like this forever. And I remember the biggest pain in the butt for me was doing a regular push-up at that point. I could, I could only do push-ups on my knees because bringing my legs up straight just caused that back to just completely knot up. 
thought of some good, but it's not. Uh -huh. So suggest the sequence of treatment. So we're gonna warm up the tissue before we do any type of activity. It doesn't matter if we're doing joint mobilizations, doesn't matter if we're doing exercises, doesn't matter if we're just sending them out of the clinic. Warming up the tissue is the big thing. Then we're gonna do some, some something to relax the tissue and relax the muscles. Hold relax techniques work great. Maybe a grade one or a grade two mo before we move on to the better ones. Until we move on to those threes and fours if we need to, or even the fives. And that's why a lot of times if you see PTs doing grade five mobs, they'll do a lot of grade two mobs before they get to that grade five, whereas chiropractors will just kind of pop. PT will do a little bit to warm up the tissue and then be like, okay, take a deep breath in, take a deep breath in and let it out, wham. And they get that pop going on and they kind of use that inhibition technique to help with it. Then after we get that range of motion, look, some passive stretching. Right? Again, to further increase those tissues, stretching out those muscles. Then the patient should use those new range muscles in activity, either reciprocal inhibition, active range of motion, functional activities. And then when they go home, they should be given instructions on how to help do their own stretching, do their own mobilization, and then their functional range of motion, right? So this would be a time if we know that it's the joint capsule that's the problem and not necessarily the muscle, we want to teach them how to self-mobilize, but maybe we give them that as one of their activities. And then after they do that, they're going to have 15 reaches above the head. So they're actively using that after they've self-mobilized. And there are all kinds of things we can do to self-mobilize. We don't have to bounce, right? I could take a foam roller if I need to po posteriorly mobilize my shoulder. I could lay prone and put a foam roller under the front of my joint capsule here and allow it to push it posteriorly into retraction. And that's still a joint mobilization. And Dr. Reskin will talk to this a little bit about it, especially with the shoulder next semester, is you've got to watch what you put under the shoulder when you're range of motion in the shoulder or when you're doing any type of stretching the shoulder. Because even by putting a small amount of the pillow under the shoulder, you've now changed it from being a pure stretch technique into being a stretch with mobilization. So you've got to pay attention when you're doing that, what position the patient's in, and then what's supporting their joint structures, because you could be doing something that's not intentional and not what you want, right? If you're stretching and you've got that joint capsule wide open, you may not want that. So you have to think actively about everything in the patient's positioning when you're moving them, right? That's why when we taught you guys positioning and draping, we made sure that the pillow was primarily only under that occiput. But let's think about that. Now a patient's laying on a pillow and they're doing range of motion of the neck. When they come back down, they're actually staying in a sustained mobilization because that pillow is blocking them from retracting the full way. So you kind of have to think about that when they're doing exercises. So if joint motion is restricted, well, we have to figure out if it's a capsular or non-capsular pattern, right? And if it's capsular, it's those joint ligaments, the tendons, the actual, you know, maybe the labrum, stuff like that. If it's non-capsular, it's extra capsular structures, such as the muscles or maybe the bones themselves. You cannot, joint mobilizations on a non-capsular pattern may not help. It may, you may get some residual effect from it. But if the pattern is a non-capsular problem, you're going to get much better results out of doing stretching and strengthening type techniques. If it is a capsular problem and you do stretching and strengthening techniques and you don't do joint mobilizations, you may still get results. Because even when you're moving somebody through a stretch of the shoulder flexion, you are mobilizing the joint capsule. So you may still get a result out of it, but you're not going to get as much out of doing a direct mobilization at a joint capsule. And this is just talking about like when your ankles, when you're short sitting like I am right now versus long sitting, the capsules feel different based upon the position that you're in. So here's kind of looking at it right. Here's our joint capsule. Our joint capsule is all this associated structure, whereas all of this associated structure on the right, so this is looking at our joint capsule, all of this structure is looking at the extra capsular tissue. And if you look, I mean, just look at that joint capsule, good grief. That is a lot of stuff to 
have to remember and where it's at and what's going on and where's the cuboid at and what's the, what's the bifurcate ligament, what's the talofibular, what's the anterior talofibular, all that stuff, all that makes up the capsule itself. Well, the good news is most of the time that we're moving those joint mobilizations, we're mobilizing that full joint capsule. We're not focusing on just, you know, mobilizing the bifurcate ligament. That would be just literally impossible. So capsular patterns are usually often limited by only small amounts. The most accurate measurement is a bilateral comparison. So if I suspect a patient has a capsular pattern, I'm going to check range of motions on both sides because it's very rare that a patient is going to have a capsular pattern on both sides. It's not uncommon for them to have a non-capsular pattern on both sides where both sides of the muscles are tight, but it's pretty rare for them to have only have both capsules be tight at the same time. Uh, look at each joint having specific limitation or range of motion. We talked about that going through those range of motions. And again, if the limit of motion is not in the capsule, that's where we start looking for other things. That's where the breadcrumb leads us elsewhere. And this dry roast coffee is really good. So this is looking at the capsular patterns of the joints. I think I put together a two slide here. And so what I did here is I pulled these right out of your book. This may be some good slides to print off on your own and put into your clinical binder. Because this will give you, here's your capsular pattern of most of the joints in the body. And this is also going to give you your open and closed pack position of most of the joints in your body. Temporal mandibular joint. Let's talk about that briefly. Because this is a common one. Has anyone ever heard somebody say that I've got TMJ? Right? So the next time somebody says that to you, what I want you to do is, no way. You only have one? I have two. Yeah, we all do, right? Exactly. I love doing that to people. And they just stare at me. What they really are saying is they have TMD, temporomandibular disorder, right? They have a problem with that joint. And when they have a problem with that joint, a lot of times that is a capsular pattern, right? What causes problem people to have TMD? What are some common causes? I get it from the way I sleep at night. Because, yeah, I grind my teeth and I clench really hard when I'm sleeping, right? Guess what else can cause it? Whiplash, good. Yep, talking too much right? Because you're constantly open and closing, causing micro trauma. Oh, it can. Yeah, absolutely can. Now it can be both ways, right? It can also help if you've got it already by moving it, you're mobilizing it. So it's one of those double-edged swords. You got to be careful. You're not doing too much, right? And I just saw the other day, I, I've never seen a commercial for this. Have you guys, seen, I'm, I'm going to find the, the bite exerciser just so that you can see the commercial because of how ridiculous the commercial is. I'm going to find that just so I can show it real quick then. Um, oh my God. It's, the commercial is ridiculous. Um, but yeah, they actually make something that uh, strengthen your teeth down. Believe it or not, in the martial arts, we used to do that, especially when you get up to the professional level. My instructor would give you five pieces of, um, what, is that, what is that cheap gum they give out at Halloween? The pink gum that's cheap. Double bubble. Oh, a bazooka works too, yeah. Right, both of those work really well. But my instructor used to, before we went into matches, he would give you about four or five pieces of that bubble gum to chew for about 20 minutes. Because it tightened up the jaw, supposedly. I always thought it was stupid and I thought it was just give me sugar. Right, but man, that happens. As PTAs and PTs, can we mobilize the jaw? Yep. There's a whole field of physical therapy dedicated to TMJ, right? I will say that's not something I ever want to do because a lot of your mobilizations involve you doing what? Sticking your fingers in the person's mouth. Yeah, right? And just stare. That's why I didn't want to become a dentist. I don't want to stare into people's mouths. It's just not something I want. I appreciate the dentist and the dental hygienist. I don't know how they put up with my mouth, but I just can't do that. That just wouldn't work, right? I, I'm like, okay, instead of, let's just do some massage. We'll massage. 
but yeah, so, I mean, if you look at this, the closed pack position of the TMD or the TMJ joint is clenched T. Well, now that makes sense. If that's the closed pack position. It makes sense why people would get some TND when they hold it in that position. So there's techniques for all of these joint complexes. We'll practice a few of these. There's no way I can get you guys to learn all of the different types of joint mobilizations. It's just not possible. There are way, 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 way too many different techniques for this, okay? So let's say you work with a PT and your PT is like, hey, you know, I want you to do some lateral elbow mobilizations on patient B. And you're like, oh, crap, Mr. McKeever didn't cover those. What should you say? Should you say Mr. McKeever didn't cover those? If you do, I'll find you. I have a very special skill set. Yeah. Hey, no problem. You know, we cover joint mobilizations, but I, we didn't really cover this specifically. Can you show me how to do it? If you show me, I'll be glad to do it for you, right? I always say, what I, what I when I was, a, my big thing for um, when I was a student and also when I have students, I always say that when you're a student or when you have a student, you become Missouri. Because at that point you become the show me state. Right? Show me how to do this. Show me. Let me show you how to do this. This is what I learned in school. And believe it or not, the clinicians want you guys to come out because you guys are coming out with some stuff that maybe I have. So they want you to come out and kind of talk to them and see what you've learned in school and what's a little different. Um, biggest one I had the last time we sent students out was we had a whole clinic that didn't realize that um, CPMs weren't as effective at the six-week mark. And the student did a whole presentation on it. And guess what? That clinic no longer uses CPMs now. They're now doing active motion and you know manual therapy with their clients instead of that. So you, we, you guys, the students, can have changes. I'm not saying I had a change. I'm saying the student had to change them. There's shoulder girdle motions. There's elbow and forearm, wrist and hand. The wrist and hand mobilizations are some of the most complex, to be 100% honest. Same thing with the foot. Uh, we don't talk a lot about it, but I'll show you a, a quick j mob then for the cuboid. The hip joint, knee and joint, and the ankle. So we're talking about it. Remember, with the capsular pad in the shoulder, the greatest resistance is in lateral rotation, followed by abduction and medial rotation. So this is just kind of showing some distraction techniques. A lot of times you'll see gait belts on the patient. The gait belt is so that the PT or the PTA can have both hands on the joint that we're mobilizing. That gait belt is nothing more than holding the patient in place. Now, you have to be careful with this because if I put that gait belt on that patient and we're in the inpatient world, what have I just done? Kaylee might even know. What have I put on the patient? Yes, I put a restraint on them. And remember, in the inpatient world, restraints are no-nos, right? Literally, Jaco comes and see you doing this right here, right? Yeah, only if doctor's orders, right? The, uh, you know, Jaco comes, which is that, that wonderful company that everyone fears in the hospitals, and sees this, and you don't have doctor's orders, this is a violation of the rights. Even if you've told them, I'm just doing this to mobilize your shoulder, no, 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 not today, not in my house. Right? So in this case, if you don't have this to hold them down, you're going to have to stabilize and do one-handed mobilizations. So at that point, the PT is just distracting them out away from the joint. So a caudal glide is exactly like it sounds, or an inferior glide. She's just taking that humeral head and sliding it down. Superior, or this is caudal glide at 90. So again, changing the angle will change your, the overall effect because it changes the angle of the scapula. Yeah, so it has to have a buckle thing and unbuckle. Yeah, even that, honestly, Kaylee, I avoid at all costs because I just don't want that even a remote thought that I was restraining them because I could only imagine my luck. That'll be the day that Jayco comes in. Like, yep, yeah. 
I mean, I had a patient that the nurses insisted that the patient, when they're up in their wheelchair, have the full, they had a four point harness on their wheelchair. Like, make sure you put that four point harness on the patient. It's like, tell you what, I'll get the patient to the wheelchair. You guys can do that. And I documented in my notes, physician patient in wheelchair restraints unhooked, just because I didn't want to be the person that got accused of restraining the patient. There's posterior glide. Again, the force at this point is directed. You can use a gate belt. Gate belts are okay because the gate belts aren't attached to anything. Does that make sense? Now, if you got a gate belt, you wrap the gate belt around a pole at the hospital and then you attach it to the patient. Now, not so great. And there are times where you may think about doing that. <laughs> but that's not what you want to do, right? Or a gate belting the patient to the bed. Right? I've seen gate belts used as restraints before, and you don't want to do that. Um, I've seen them used on kids a lot. Uh, I, I was at a clinic where they did this a lot, where the, page, the kids were swingers and hitters, that they put the gate belt around their belly and around their wrists. So their arms are down at their sides, so they can't swing at you. Now, there's a downside to that, because then if we're doing gate training, are we doing effective gate training? No, because they have no arm swing, right? And trust me, I'm going to warn you about this, guys. You work with some of these kids, man, they are masters at swinging when you're not paying attention. And they will hit you in places that you didn't know could hurt so bad. I'm just saying. Or you did know and you didn't know kids could hurt you that bad. So here's a posterior glide, again, using the long axis of the humerus. Yeah really. They are not as weak as they look. That's all I'm saying. So this person, they, she's using the long axis of the humerus, current to the patient for the best, yeah, to actually push down. You could also just push on that posterior glide capsule of the shoulder as well, but this gives us a long lever arm to work with. Now here, what is she doing with that posterior glide? Why does she have the gate belt around her? Does anyone have an idea? Well, what she's doing, it could stabilize. If we, stay, if we push this way, you'd be stabilizing. But if you look at her butt, it's slightly backwards. Yeah, right? So she's using a little bit of her body weight to distract that shoulder out of the joint so that when she downwardly mobilizes, she has a little bit more range of motion, right? I do this quite a bit when I'm doing distraction techniques. I use a gate belt a lot, and I'll show you some of the techniques I use for this. Because if you have to do distraction on this patient, and it's oftentimes when we're doing traction on the shoulder like this, we're going to do traction for five minutes. Right? So if you get a, get a hold of that shoulder for your hands and then pull, and you're pulling with your arms for five minutes, at about the three minute mark, you're starting to feel burning. At about the three minute and 30 second mark, it's starting to get uncomfortable about the four minute mark, you don't like this anymore. And then about the five minute mark, when you're done with your traction, you need traction. But you can use gate belts like this and wrap them around the limbs and use your body weight to do the traction. And then literally, if I was doing traction on this arm, I could just sit back slightly. And now I've got traction, I don't have to do any work. And I could just kind of lean back. I can lean back for five minutes. Technically in the hospital, that would be considered a restraint because the patient is connected to you. But again, Kelly, this is one thing, so a lot of times in the hospital, we're not gonna do a lot of traction, so it's not something you're really gonna have to worry about. Because most of the time, honestly, I'm gonna be 100% honest with you guys, in the hospital, guess what the, yeah, it's a murky water. Guess what the biggest thing you guys are gonna be doing with a patient in the hospital, for the most part? Walking, yeah, transfers and walking. It's, it's going to be rough to even get them up and out of bed most times. So the likelihood that I ever get to distraction of the joints is pretty low. And if I am and they're in the inpatient world, I'm only going to get traction for 30 or 40 seconds. And at that point, I'll just use my strength. There's an anterior glide, again, using the long axis of the humerus. And you notice one thing I don't like about this is she does not have good body mechanics. I don't know who she is, but... 
our teacher did not teach her well. These are ones we will do a little bit because this will be one that I think everyone will really, 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 really like. We're going to do some scapula thoracic mobs. And you guys won't realize how tight your scapulas are until we mobilize it a little bit. And then you feel what it feels like afterwards. So we're going to do this in lab. Elbow complex loss of flexion is greater than loss of extension. So elbow, we can do distraction. We can do humor or ulnar distraction with a distal glide, which is just kind of pulling out and up. There's more distraction. We can do dorsal and volar glides. And we can do medial and lateral glides. But remember, those, those medial and lateral collateral ligaments of the elbow are really, really tight. So you're not going to get a lot of medial and lateral gliding when you're doing that shoulder or that elbow. There's distal radial ulnar joint, right? They're doing dorsal and volar. At the wrist, you'll have equal loss of flexion and extension, slight loss of ulnar and radial deviation. So we can do distraction, the dorsal and volar glides, or you can call them anterior and posterior glides at the wrist as well. I like doing these because they're really easy and it doesn't take a lot of force. Anyone that I get, I'm like, oh, you've got to do, you know, palmer glides of the hand. I'm like, oh, please, thank you. There's ulnar deviation glides. It's really hard to do radial deviation glides. It doesn't work that well because you don't have a lot of range of motion. The hip is the greatest loss of range of motion is a medial rotation and flexion, right? So with the hip, here's hip distraction. I'm going to guarantee if you have to do distraction on the hip, I would suggest getting a gait belt because this gets tiring. Especially if you're lifting my leg, you're gonna have to lift my leg, hold my leg and pull on my leg. So what she's done here is a, what's called a figure eight wrap. So she's taken the gait belt, put it around herself, went over her hands, around the ankle, back around and back here. And she has this kind of figure eight here around her hands. And really, her hands aren't even holding that leg anymore. They're just there to stabilize it. The gait belt's what's holding the leg. And then she can just lean back into that belt and she gets her traction gone. And we have a hip posterior glide. And again, she's using the gait belt, not necessarily to do the motion, but just to support the leg so she doesn't have to hold it up. You could even just put a pillow under that leg or small like towel, and then just put that gait belt around your shoulder and do the same thing. Just watch if you do have one of these gait belts up on your shoulder, make sure it's on the meat of your shoulder and not up here towards your neck where it can actually cause some pain for you. There's an anterior glide, again, using that, the uh, belt to kind of support the leg. You can also do an anterior thrust mobilization. This position, this is not something we would do, but this is the position that PT would do the manipulation for the thrust. With the knees, greater loss of motion in flexion than in extension. And for the knee, we can do distraction in different directions. We can do posterior glide drawers or drawer glides. We can do anterior dry glide drawer, uh, drawer glides. I can speak. But mostly at the knee, these are the mobs we're going to do is telephemoral mobs. And if you notice, you put that little towel roll back there that takes her just slightly, the person into flexion slightly. You can do inferior superior glides. You can do lateral medial glides. You're going to help with patellar tracking by doing those glides. In the ankle, we already talked about the patterns for capsules, so I'm not going to go through that. This is looking at the actual ankle. We can do talocrural distraction. And again, I don't like this body position. Look at that back. My back is just aching, looking at the way her back is. What could she do? What could she do to help her posture? Raise table, or you know what I'd do, honestly? I'd sit down. Because if she sat down, she'd be here, and she can still get force pulling backwards. Right? And then I can use the wheels of the wheelchair, the wheels of the chair as well, to help me kind of roll backwards to get that distraction. There's tail accrual posterior glide, tail accrual anterior glide, subtalar distraction, subtalar lateral glides. Tarsal glides are really comfortable for patients, especially if they've got um, plantar fasciitis. 
just moving around those tarsals sometimes can stretch out that plantar fascia a little bit and it really makes the feet feel good. I will openly admit feet are my weakness. I hate doing feet. I just, I don't know what it is about feet. I think it was because the first patient I saw with feet had gangrene and ever since then, I think every foot has gangrene. Yeah, feet just, I don't know, with feet weird me out, especially hobbit feet, you know, where you have hairs all over the toes. All right, so that's it for this. Let me find a video real quick. Uh, I think this is the video I want. Oh, it's 11 minutes. That's not what I want. Oh, kind of creepy. Oh God! But uh, I. Funny, it's funny. As soon as I talked about it, I just got the, the video for the mouth exercise activity. It's great. I'm gonna have to find that here real quick. YouTube. When I first saw this product, I... All right, I, I want to show you this video then, but I'm going to show you the, the cuboid whip first. All right, so this is one of this is kind of an, what I was talking about when we talk about um, more of a thrust manipulation. But this is kind of looking when we have a cuboid that slipped out of place for a patient. So there's that. Make sure I've got the audio on. I've got the audio shared. This is Brent of the Brookbush Institute, and in this video, we're going to go over manipulation. I'm not doing an 11-minute video. That was not what I was doing. That was the one I wanted to skip. It was the one-minute one that I want to do. Where's that one-minute one that I just had? When I first saw this product, I thought it looked kind of crazy. I don't care about your product. There we go. There's the one-minute one. I am not watching 11 minutes of somebody working on foot. The cuboid whip technique is a midfoot manipulation technique targeted to treat midfoot instability. Now our goal here is to relocate the cuboid bone in a plantar to dorsal fashion. The cuboid bone is often dislocated in the plantar direction with inversion ankle sprains, so this can be a treatment for that patient population. We want our patient positioned in prone with about 70 degrees of knee flexion. We then want to grab the medial and lateral borders of the foot with our web spaces and find the plantar aspect of the cuboid bone with our thumb. Maintaining 70 degrees of knee flexion, we want to maximally dorsiflex the foot. Now the manipulation procedure is coming down into knee extension, plantar flexion rather, and supination. So again, we're coming into plantar flexion and supination while performing a, poster uh, sorry, a posterior to anterior force on the cuboid bone. So here we go. And this procedure can be performed repeatedly while mo monitoring patient response. So that's kind of looking at what a, a grade five MOBE actually would be. I found the jaws are sizing, just so that you guys can see it here. This is hilarious. If you haven't seen this yet, this is- When I first saw this product, I thought it looked kind of crazy. Didn't really understand what the benefits would be, but uh, I had seen some before and after pictures on the website and thought to myself, you know what, I'm 48 years old. My face is starting to look a little bit aged. Wouldn't hurt to try. So after 30 days, I could not believe my before and after picture. I literally rolled back the hands of time 10 years. And the best way I can explain this product is it's like something you've never experienced. You have about 40 pounds of resistance right there. Now I'm pushing that down as hard as I can, but when I put it in my mouth and exercise, my jaw can handle that kind of pressure, no problem. So what I discovered is that after using this product, after maybe 100 or 200 reps, all of a sudden I feel all this blood flow coming into my, into my face, into my scalp. And a couple things happened. Number one, I felt a lot more awake and energized. It was a great stress reliever. 
but if it wasn't for the before and after picture, I probably wouldn't have totally seen the dramatic change that happened in my face. So Brandon was nice enough to take, I live here on Maui with Brandon, he was nice enough to take a before picture, and then about 30 days later, we took an after picture, and the results are absolutely amazing. So what I believe he has stumbled upon here is a massive discovery. Um, if you think about it, there's a piece of fitness equipment for every other part of your body, right? And why isn't there one yet for the face? And now that there is, it totally makes sense. When you work something out, you bring in blood, you bring in blood flow. I want to see somebody at the gym doing that. I so want to see somebody at the gym doing that. Flow, you strengthen things. Over time, collagen uh, reproduction drops, things start to sag. This, this device, because of the activation, the 40 pounds of resistance, all of a sudden. I want to see somebody at the gym doing that someday, just because just I think it'd be funny. Yeah, that, I think it would give me a headache too, Kelly. I don't know. That would be kind of rough on me. But just by Polly Pocket. <laughs> I didn't even think about that. That's, that's, that's hilarious. Maybe that's why kids can talk so much is because they spend so much time chewing stuff. Huh? Maybe? I don't know. I just thought that was funny. I thought you guys would appreciate it. All right, let me get the stuff up for Therex real quick. All right, do we need another break? Do you want to go a little bit and then take a break? How are you feeling? Keep going, okay. So we're gonna change gears now and leave Kinese behind and move into Therex and we're gonna talk about the knee and ankle. So I'm gonna bring up the slide here. So we're gonna talk about the knee and ankle joint for Therex here. I'll separate these out when I do the lecture ed audios then. So the knee and ankle, we've talked about this ad nauseum, so we're not going to talk about the complex itself, but we know that we've got the tibiofemoral joint and the patellofemoral joint. We know the arthrokinematics and the screw home mechanism already. We've talked to that pretty importantly. The one thing we didn't really talk about is the patellar alignment. That patella needs to be in a very specific alignment in order to allow for the pulley system of the, the actual patellar tendon to work and increase the force of our knee. That's what allows us to walk upright. Right, telemalignment malalignment problems, we can have an increased Q angle, muscle tightness, hip weakness, or just a lax medial capsule or insufficient BMO can all cause that patella not to track properly. And if that patella doesn't track properly, you'll get a lot of knee pain. And most times they'll say that it feels like my knee is tight in the front of my knee. It's usually a good sign that the, you've got a problem with the patellar tracking. Who's gonna have more problems with patellar tracking, men or women? What do you think? Yeah, women typically have more problem with patellar tracking. That's why they get with PFPS so much. The patella is gonna have a certain amount of compression force on it, usually caused by the soft tissue pulling it down, right? But if you have a lot of swelling, that compression can be even worse. It can be forced down into that patellar tendon. So with the knee extension, we have closed chain and we have open chain knee extension, right? When we do an open chain knee extension, we're kind of kicking out. When we do closed chain, we're standing up. As we do that stand-up function, the patella is going to track, right? And that's going to move in and help adjust that angle of pull. So when we get upright, we can get locked into that screw home mechanism. That's where that torque's coming in with it. That slight twisting motion when we get locked in. That allows us to get fully upright and then not rely on just our muscles to be standing straight up. If we had to rely on all of our muscles to keep standing straight, we'd actually get tired quite a bit. The knee flexor muscles are going to help us, right? Our popliteus is going to start by unlocking our knee. And then the group of muscles, the flexors that are our hamstrings, will slowly bring that foot back. And if you watch a tracking of the knee, it does come out of a rotational force when it goes from unlock. Dynamic stability of the knee is needed for doing sports, right? All, pretty much all sports where you're running of some sort, you need dynamic stability of the knee. You need to be able to cut, right? 
jump laterally back and forth. Soccer especially, right? Soccer, running backs in football, linebackers and wide receivers. Offensive linemen, not necessarily so much. Usually offensive linemen stand up and push, and that's about all we do. Um, but the rest of the teams like that, basketball, right? Basketball requires a lot of lateral movement of that knee when they're kind of fake people out and stuff like that, or so I hear. During gait, right? Our quadriceps are going to, most of the muscles, actually, let's just go through most, when we talk about most of the muscles, most of the muscles of the knee are going to have concentric and then eccentric functions as you're moving through your gait cycle. So for some of it, you're going to get a concentric contraction. And then you'll get to a point where instead of having that concentric contraction, now you're slowing down the movement. And now you're doing eccentric. The eccentric loading is actually quite great when you're walking. That's why I said that most of the stuff we do is an eccentric world. We need functional eccentric control. We don't want foot slap. We want the leg to rest slowly down when we go into heel strike. So that when we go into kind of pushing through, we can slow ourselves down and get nice quality gait cycling. So let's think about hip problems, right? If I have a hip flexion contracture, is that going to affect my knee? So if I'm stuck in 20 degrees of hip flexion, is that going to affect my knee? Mm -hmm. Right? My quads are going to have just less mechanical advantage at that point, and my hamstrings are going to be resisting that kind of that weird angle of the hip. Also, just think about gait, right? If I'm stuck in, say, 30 degrees of hip flexion, my gait's going to be horrible, right? I'm not going to get a good quality swing. I'm going to be more kind of oompa loompa it around the room. Leg length and strength imbalances, right? If we have one leg that's more dominant than the other, we tend to wear that shoe out a little bit more, right? Because that's the leg that we put most of our weight on. We all, if you actually tracked our gait, we all will spend a little bit more time on one foot than the other. That's just kind of the way it is, right? Also, if you spend more time on that foot, is that going to increase the wear on that side of the leg itself? Yeah, right? So that means that's probably going to be the knee that has more pain in it. That's going to be the knee that might need the knee replacement later on in life, right? What else might cause us to spend more time on one foot than the other? What would cause us, yeah, pain, right? I sprain my ankle on my left side, I'm not going to want to put my weight down on that left ankle. So I'm going to spend more time on my right side. And because I spend more time on my right side, now I'm wearing that side out a lot more. And you're going to find out you go home at the end of the night, and you, know, you, sprain, you sprain your ankle and you go to work. You come home at the end of the night, and not only does your ankle now hurt, but now your hip hurts. Antalgic gait, is that what you're talking about? To make up for some con or compensation. Right? Foot impairments. Again, that can be pain. That can be anything, right? Also, just think about it. If you're walking across a room full of Legos, you're probably going to spend more time on the foot that's not stepping on the Legos. I'm just saying. Legos are the great crippler of new parents. Common nerve injuries that get injured at the knee. The fibular nerve or the common peroneal nerve, right? Where is that nerve at? Where is your common peroneal nerve? Good, it's on the fibular or lateral side, right? That's the one I told you to avoid when you're doing what? Remember I said when you're doing ultrasound, you gotta be careful if you're doing anything on that, that lateral collateral ligament that you don't bump it. Well, that's going down there right kind of in that area of the fibular head and the tibia and the lateral aspect of the femur. So that can get pinched there. Where's your saphenous? Where's your saphenous region? It's in the leg, good. Yeah, but where's the saphenous nerve primarily fall? Where's your saphenous vein and nerve at? The anterior or posterior side. I don't know where that accent came from. Yeah, I'm having a stroke. Anterior posterior side. 
So your anterior is your primary fibular and tibial, posterior is where your saftness comes out of. Yeah, right? That, so, that saftness is then gonna split in other branches as well. So it's really common for back there in the back of the knee for it to get pinched. All right, so now a patient comes in to see you guys and they're complaining about burning, tingling, and numbness behind the knee. Is it likely that the knee is the problem? No, right, what's likely the problem? Yeah, no low back and hip are the usually sciatic, right? And so this will be really kind of confusing to a patient because they'll come in and say, well, I'm seeing you because I've got knee pain. Why are you exercising my back? And convincing them that, well, the problem is up here. It's just referring down here is interesting, right? So posterior aspect of the knee, we got sciatic nerve. Anterior aspect of the knee, what's getting referred? What nerve? So what, what one's going to come down the front of the legs? What bone are you on? The femur, so that would be the femoral, right? Yeah, so your femoral is the nerve in the front. So if you get referred pain down the front of the legs, it's usually your femoral nerve. And a lot of times it can become impinged at that femoral triangle up in that inguinal region, right? And then you have the backside of the legs, usually going to be your sciatic that's most of the time referred down there. Does that mean you don't get other referred pain in the legs? No, there can be other reasons you have that pain, right? But for the most part, if you have those two aspects, it's usually coming from the low back and one of those two nerves. So osteoarthritis. Who's going to get osteoarthritis of the knee? All of us. Well, women mainly, right? But all of us are going to get osteoarthritis of the knee, folks. Everyone. Right? It's every day, bro we're all gonna kind of break down that knee eventually. Rheumatoid arthritis, again, rheumatoid conditions are autoimmune conditions. So it's not, unco not uncommon for people that have other autoimmune conditions end up with rheumatoid-like conditions. You know, people that have psoriasis that is really bad, people that has lu have lupus, that type of thing. It's not uncommon for them to also have some rheumatoid arthritis problems and get some nodules going on in the knee. Post-immobilization hypomobility. So maybe you went in and you had a stroke and you've been immobilized in bed for six weeks, right? Now when you get up, that knee is not going to be very mobile. And so we're going to have to work the knee to get it back to functional process, right? Again, the most common thing that's going to happen is we're going to lose some of that extension. Again, if we lose the extension, it's really hard to get back. Number one thing we can do with these patients is walk, but they don't want to walk because walking hurts a lot of times. But we need to convince them that yes, walking hurts, but the way to make walking hurting stop is by walking more, right? The more you sit and the more you become immobile, that vicious cycle kicks in where it gets worse and worse. So they need to, you know, the common thing for patients do when they get problems with the knee, they start, stop doing their activities and they start participating in life. And because they stop doing those two things, their knee pain gets bad. So the knee pain gets worse. So now they'll stop doing more activities and stop doing more of their life activities. So the knee pain gets worse and you get stuck in this just wicked, vicious cycle. So it's really important to convince patients that look, you know, I know that your knee hurts and you don't wanna play basketball right now, but we still need you to get up and walk and we need you to get on the treadmill for a couple minutes a day. We need you to go outside and walk for a little bit for a day. It's amazing how it's just a little bit of walking really helps your health. So when we have that initial injury and we're in that protection phase, that acute phase, right? Just like anything else, we're, any other joint that we have, we're gonna primarily focus on passive range of motion, right? And some slides and glides of the knee just to kind of keep everything you know, mobile and agile. We're not really improving anything in that acute care phase of injury in the knee. So maybe you have an acute knee sprain. Well, we want to stop them from doing activities that are going to aggravate it, right? Do we still want them walking? Probably, but we're not going to want them walking five to six miles a day. We still want them moving around the house and stuff like that, but we want to limit their amount of exposure so we don't kick that inflammation into high gear. And that's why we'll start with passive range of motion. Now, we'll have them do some heel slides too, which is active, but it's a very 
almost like a passive active motion. So it's not a hardcore, you know, tearing up the knee type activity. And obviously our setting exercises, any of those good isometric exercises you do in that acute care phase really can help them overall improve and maintain some of the strength of those muscles. Controlled motion, we're stepping out of that acute phase and now coming into that subacute phase, right? We want to start decreasing pain from mechanical stress. That means we get to look. Do they have patellar tracking issues? If they have patellar tracking issues. How can we improve that patellar tracking? Do they have tight muscles? Can we stretch those muscles and warm them up to reduce pain? Maybe the patient says, well, every morning when I wake up, I just it takes me so long to get up and walking because my legs hurt. Well, maybe then we go, okay, well, let's educate you and go, okay, how about before you get out of bed in the morning, let's do 10 quad sets, 10 ham sets, 10 glute sets, and get the muscles kind of firing and waking up. And like I say, start doing that, like, oh, man, you know, when I get up, I feel a little bit better now when I do that. It's amazing. Physical therapy works. Once we get into this kind of post-acute phase here, we're in a subacute phase, now we can start thinking about those greater... Uh, greater range of motions in those joint plate or joint mobs as well, right? Maybe going into those grade threes, maybe ideally towards the end of that subacute phase, move into those grade fours where we get that really good stretch going on. And then mobilization with movement. Again, nothing replaces moving. Motion is lotion. They will mobilize that joint just walking around. So they will mobilize the knee and just walk around as long as they get good gait cycling, which means you need to be following behind them and cueing them in. Oh, hey, come on. You didn't strike down with the heel that time. Okay, remember, heel roll through to the toes. Heel roll through to the toes. There should be never a time when you're either in the inpatient world or outpatient world where you're walking a patient. Maybe you've got a gait butt on them. They're walking around the room with a walker, and you're just talking to them regularly. I mean, talking to regularly is fine, but you want to be giving them cueing constantly, kind of helping them out. Oh, that was, that was good. Now let's try it with the left leg. Get that left leg just as good. Patients hate when it's just dead silence, right? Because it doesn't tell them they're doing anything. Right. Patients are looking for that positive validation too, just like you guys are, right? I see it sometimes when we're doing activities. I know which ones you do it. You see me walking by and you kind of look up at me like, am I doing it right? Am I doing it right? And you want that positive validation. Or you may want the negative validation that you're doing it wrong. But you want that validation. Patients want the same thing. They want to be told when they're doing things right and when they're doing things wrong so that they can improve. If we don't provide them with that feedback, they'll never know. Moving to progressive strengthening, muscle endurance, and functional training is what we're doing. At this point, we can start moving to cardiopulmonary endurance and start doing some activities like the bike, the treadmill, and overall improving the long term. Our outcome at that point should be to get them to a phase where they're not in that chronic phase of inflammation of the knee, right? Surgery. So a lot of times articular cartilage is going to get damaged in the knee. It just is, right? Whether it's meniscus, whether it's the actual, you know, the, the end cap articular cartilage of both the bones, it's going to get damaged. It can happen from any type of, you know, normal breakdown to a fracture, right? So what would be an indication for having articular cartilage surgery? Well, maybe there's a microfracture where the small amount of fractures cause some problems and some massive tearing going on. They may do this thing, it's called osteochondral autograft transplantation or a mosaoplasty. That's a fancy way of saying, we're gonna do surgery and borrow cartilage from somewhere else to put it in your knee tips. That's what a chondroplasty is, right? They can do autologous chondrocyte implementation, where they're actually implementing stem cells in the hopes of actually stimulating growth of some more of the cartilage, right? Allograft, right? Autograft is from who? Right? What's an allograft? Where do you think you're going to get allografts from? Yeah, dead people, right? And then the animal is what type of graft? Xenograft, right? I always think of, this is the way I always remember that. I remember that an alien graft is a xenograft because of the xenomorphs. That's the way I remember it. 
And for those who don't know, Xenomorphs are the aliens from Alien and from Alien vs. Predator, which are some awesome movies. Man, those the acting in those, God, so great. Predator movies. Predator movies just, mm. That last Predator movie, that was like the epitome of acting I've ever seen. I don't think anything can ever get better. But all of these are reasons to repair the cartilage. Now, if they repair the cartilage, after surgery, is it immediate that we're going to probably want to get them up and weight bearing on that cartilage? Probably, but we're not going to want a lot of force on it. We're not going to want them running right after surgery, right? Because that, art, that cartilage they've repaired has to kind of settle down. But eventually we'll get to that kind of return and post-operative management where they are returning to normal function. Now, if they have to go in and remove and maybe deglove the end of the femur because the, your cartilage is just that torn up, even if they do a transplantation, you're not going to have normal functioning cartilage in that knee anymore. And you may be limited in the activities you can take place in until you maybe need a knee replacement, right? They may just replace the cartilage because the longer we can push off that knee replacement, the better. The, the replacements have gotten better in time, but a lot of times, you know, within that 10, it used to be five years, you know, within 10 years, guess what happens to that joint replacement? It fails. And so they've got to go back in and re-replace the joint because you've got scar tissue built up in there and all kinds of crap like that. So, you know, I'm not saying that every one breaks every down every five years, 10 years, but it used to, they used to break down every about five years. And so figure if you're 45 and you get a total knee replacement, even if you say every 10 years, now you need a replacement at 55. Now you need a new replacement at 65. Now you need a new replacement at 75. If you lived to 85, you need another. If you made it to 95, you need another. So that's why you want to try to push off getting replacements as long as you can so that, you know, you keep your functional tissue longer than the non-functional tissue. TKA or TKRs, right? Total knee arthroplasties, total knee replacements. They are the same thing. The surgery should only be done if there's no other option for this patient. Right? We don't want to replace a knee unless we have no other option. They are going to be open surgeries. Right? That means they are going to have a long scar going down the anterior aspect of the knee. And we watch that surgery with that total knee. Right, They're going to have a nasty long scar. When those bones are, when those... Um, Prosthetics are affixed, depending upon how functional the marrow of the bone is, will determine whether the doctor uses a cement fixation or uses a bony fixation, where the bone is going to hold it in place. Overall, I've seen better results out of the docs that are able to get a good bony replacement and not have to use cement, because cement eventually will fail. And that's where we ended up with that failure rate on those total knee replacements. What do you think of the major complication from total knee replacement? What do you think the, the biggest complication that happens after total knee replacements? The worst one that can happen, other than failure of the components. Infection, right? Yeah. And so this happens more frequently than not. What, do you, what could cause an infection of that surgery site? And remember, it doesn't only have to, yeah, water from showers, good, yep. Not doing what to the wound site. Not cleaning it, right? Especially not changing the dressing. Um, I had one where I saw the patient at the inpatient clinic. I saw him before he went in for surgery for pre-op. And then he went in for surgery. I didn't see him after the surgery. But then I saw him at our outpatient clinic about two weeks later. And I looked at his dressing and his dressing was kind of yellowish and kind of nasty. And I said, what's going on with this dressing? And he goes, oh, well, that's the dressing I got after I left the hospital. He had the same dressing on the wound for two weeks. And why? Because he wasn't told he had to change it. So he just 
kept walking around and never changed the dressing. And let me tell you, that underside of that dressing looked funky, right? So cleaning and changing the dressings to make sure everything's neat. But then sometimes, unfortunately, you know, you just get an infection, right? Maybe when they did that sterilization of the knee before surgery, they didn't get everything. And you got one little piece of MRSA that somehow or other was fighting for its life and got into your knee incision. It happens, right? What you don't want is that to become septic where it's in the blood or where it attacks the bone itself and you get, you know, some sort of an osteomyelitic infection. But let's say you do. Let's say that you went for total knee replacement. Somehow or other, a MRSA germ got into that infect that wound. It infected the wound and now has infected the bone. What are they going to have to do now? Well, maybe amputate. Hopefully, it's not that bad. But they're going to have to reopen you up, take out all those components that they just put in. And remember, I talked to you about the hip where they put the medicinal spacer in? They can do that at the knee, too. They'll put a little spacer with medication in that as the knee kind of moves around a little bit, it squeezes that spacer and releases an antibiotic into the local area. You usually have to have that for six to eight weeks, which means, guess what? You think you're going to weight bear on that foot? Nope, it's gonna be toe touch weight bearing at best. So for eight, six to eight weeks, you're walking around and can't use that leg. Until they go back in and put the prosthetics back in and then you've got to relearn to walk again. So surgery sites are bad. Now, that osteomyelitic infection can get bad enough that like uh, Erica said, they may have to amputate. Right? Just imagine going in for a total knee replacement at 45, getting an infection, and then being told two weeks later that they're going to have to amputate your leg. Right? That, that can be life altering. Right? Not only for you, but for your significant other, for your family. So there are all kinds of complications that can happen. For some reason, when I've seen material left in surgical sites, for some reason, I've seen it in knees more than anything. And I don't understand that one. I've seen sponges left in total knees, right? I, yeah, see, even Kaylee said she's seen it. I don't understand what it is about the knee. You would think, yeah, right, you would think because the incision is not as wide as a total hip incision that they wouldn't do this. But for some reason, I think it's because they, they get so, what do you call it, so into a rhythm about doing total knees that they get a little lax on their care and they let something go down there, right? They, I've seen it where it's just a little piece of a sponge that got left behind and it's left an infection, right? It is sad though. And then, you know, here, here's one for you. Anytime that any of your friends said that they can't wear a mask, make sure you tell them to tell their surgeons that the next time they have surgery, that you don't want the surgeon passing out because they can't breathe, so don't wear a mask. So when we have the TKA or the TKR, it says immobilization and early motion. There's going to be almost no reason anymore where we immobilize the total knee replacement. We used to do it. Now, coming up from post-anesthesia care unit or PACU, right? You guys know what PACU is? Did Dr. Sokel kind of cover those abbreviations with you? Did you cover those hospital abbreviations with you all? Okay. Right, like pack you and sick you. Did you cover all those with you? Or do I need to recover them? Okay, that's what I was looking for. All right, so let's look at some, I'm gonna bring up my little text here. Let's look at some common hospital abbreviations, right? Let's just go ICU first.
Okay, so let's look at a couple of these common hospital abbreviations here. What's ED or ER? This is usually your first experience, right? Yeah. It, we used to call emergency room all the time, right? But we now call them emergency departments, EDs. And there's a reason behind that. This is a psychological reason we do this. Because we used to call them the ER, but now patients aren't guaranteed to get a room. Because if you call an emergency room, your patient's expecting you to get a room. We now call them emergency departments because I don't know if you've seen some of the EDs lately, but some of the EDs are nothing more than a bunch of jerry chairs in a line with sheets drawn between them. Right, so emergency department, good. What's the OR or the OD? Operating room or department, right? Right, this is also known as surgery. Don't laugh because I misspelled something. Okay, PACU I just talked about. What's PACU? Post anesthesia, right? This is where you wake up and you're staring to the nurse that's checking on you. You're like, are you an angel? No. Can I have some jello? Right, that's where you come out of your anesthesia. Maybe I'm just speaking from experience, okay? What is ICU? This is what, something that um, Grey's Anatomy loves to talk about. The ICU is the intensive care unit, right? And some hospitals then have multiple ICUs, right? So the sick you. Does anyone know what sick you is? What's the S stand for? Surgical, right? And it's either surgical intensive care unit or surgical intervention care unit, depends upon what hospital again. So these are patients that come out of surgery, have gone through PACU, but are still in a really severe state, right? Intensive care unit are patients that come in that are sick and say they have COVID. Right, they come in, they are medically sick, they can't go onto a regular floor, so they go to the intensive care unit where the nursing unit or the nursing ratio is a lot lower. Right? It's a lot, a lot, a lot lower, especially when you get onto the regular med floors. That ratio can be ridiculous about how many patients one nurse has. What's CICU? Yeah, cardiac intensive care unit. So again, this is patients had a heart attack. Maybe they've had heart surgery, but they're not good enough to go to the CCU, which is the cardiac care unit. Or the cardiac floor, right? Um, there is one I did forget to put on here. I just realized. TICU. What do you think TICU is? Trauma. Again, not all the hospitals have all these ICUs, but your bigger ones will because they want the nurses and the care people that are in those units to be specialized in dealing with whatever care this is. Because treatment of a medically sick patient is different than treatment of a cardiac sick patient. They're, they may seem really similar, but a lot of the care is gonna be different. You're gonna have, you know, if you have a patient just went in for heart surgery, open heart surgery, the amount of care they require is a lot greater than maybe the patient that's just sick. What's NICU? There's two different, yeah. NICU is a neonate, right? And I put NICU alternate here because you can also have, this is the one I hate because I don't know why they sometimes do this. I was actually in a hospital that had two NICUs. Yeah, the neonate intensive care unit and the neurological intensive care unit. 
and they didn't name them differently. And they're on different floors. And a lot of times the, the orders would come down and the patient was in NICU three. And so then he had to go find out the patient's age because if the patient was like 55, they weren't gonna be in the neonate intensive care unit. <laughs> but there are multiple times where that came down and I'd go, you know, I'd get the order for, to go see a patient in the NICU. I'd go to the NICU thinking, well, I'm treating pediatrics. And I get down there and like, we don't have any by this name. And you're like, oh, son of a gun, it's a neurological care. And then you have this common field floor called the med surge. This is our general floors, right? Um, yeah, intermediate care unit, thank you. Yeah, IMC is the other term for it. Intermediate care unit. You also have the cancer wing on certain hospitals. And cancer wing is a little different as well. And then I forgot one that you may have as well. Pick you. Then you know what pick you is? Pick you is the one that I love going to. It could be pediatrics, yeah. But a lot of times, hospitals may call it the psychological intensive care unit. When they call it the pick you, what does that look? There's only a few that have it. Um, and most of them are now just calling it uh, med psych and adult psych or a Jerry psych, right? Yeah, these are the rooms that are the fun ones, right? These are where you get the people that are, and if they call it a pick you, it's a nice way of saying a lockdown unit, right? Because usually if you're in the psych ward, you're not getting out voluntarily, right? If you're from California, a lot of times you hear them call, doing a 5150. Does anyone know what a 5150 is? If you, what? No, 5150 is a psych ward hold. If you guys have followed anything about Kanye West over the past couple of days, he's been complaining about this because he's evidently having a mental breakdown, but they want to put him in a hospital and he doesn't want to go in the hospital because he's okay. He's just tweeting about the fact that the, the Jordan Key movie or whatever was about him. Yeah, he's not losing his mind at all. But those are kind of some of the floors. Now, it doesn't mean that those are all the floors, right? Because you can also have something like your, um, your non-emergency department. You can have, you know, there's specialized units you can have. You can have an nephritis, a nephratic intensive care unit with the kidneys, right? You can have liver intensive care. There's all kinds of things they can get into. And then you have your berry floors. If you see berry floor, what are you thinking? What does a berry floor mean? Not bury, like you're burying them in the backyard. Berry stands for bariatric. Yep. And so that means you got to be doing what at that point? You got to be thinking, I got to put my big boy pants on right now. Because most of the patients you're going to see on the berry floor are going to be what? Yeah, bigger, right? Yeah, you're, you know, you're talking patients that can be up to 800, 900 pounds. Yeah, you know, most of them you're talking, you're, I mean, at minimum, you're probably talking a 400 pound patient. You know, it's pretty rare that somebody that's 275 pounds goes in to the bariatric floor, but I, technically they would be considered bariatric. Right? You could consider that patient bariatric because anything over, I think, 250 can be considered it. So if you're over 250, congratulations. You join me. Um, but you got to think about that. that. When you're working with those patients that are larger, you need different equipment, right? So if you're going to the bariatric floor, you got to make sure that you have your bariatric equipment with you because a standard walker is not going to help these people. Right? Cardiac intensive care unit or cardiac care unit. You have different equipment you take with them. So that's a quick review of those. All right, good. 
clear that. Am I okay to clear it? Now that we did that and got all off topic a little bit. All right, one second. I'll just move that up and put it up here. There we go, I'll set it down here for now. Let's shrink it, can I shrink it? Nope, shrinking it doesn't work. Oh well, I'll we'll just set it down here. Okay, and again, remember that hospitals will have their own names for everything. You just got that? I thought it was I thought it was original from the beginning. I kind of chuckled as soon as I saw it. Cuz I didn't think she was going for Kaylee Ampersand and All right. So again, immobilization, the only time they're going to be immobilized with the total knee replacement and again, unless the doc orders it, the only time they'll be immobilized is in PACU. And they'll have a knee immobilizer on in PACU just until the patient is conscious and aware of what they're doing. And the only reason is so they don't injure that surgical site. Weight bearing consideration. Who is going to set the weight bearing status of a patient that's got a total knee replacement? Who's going to yeah, the doc, right? So if it says weight bearing is tolerated, that means go for it. If it says 10% weight, weight bearing, oh, well, we got to figure that out. Um, quick, you guys have lab today? Just so that I know. Okay, so I'll make sure I get you out in a little bit here. Exercise progression. Again, we're going to just move. Start with setting exercises, warm them up. We're not going to do a lot of stretching in the inpatient world, but after they get out the outpatient, we're going to be stretching the heck out of that knee. Right, so in the maximum protection phase, our main goals is to get them to about 90 degrees of flexion and zero degrees of extension. Why would that be our goal? Zero degrees of extension because we need that for gait. 90 degrees of flexion because we need that for what? Stairs or steps. Those should be your main goals. Now, if we get the 130 degrees of knee flexion, good, good job, good on you, right? But we should be at zero to 90 by the time they are discharged because at that point they can be functional. And then we're going to move them out of that. So the first day they're in, then as, as they move through, we're going to move them to that post-acute phase until we get them back to that return to function. Let's say you have a patient that's 35 years old and has a total knee replacement. Can they go back to playing soccer? Yeah, in a while, absolutely, right? We actually kind of want to encourage it. It's just like somebody that has their knees repaired for like ACL, PCL, or maybe at a sports injury, they can go back to playing their sport. There's not that says they won't. Now, some people will say, oh my God, you tore on your ligaments. You're never going to play this again. And if you've got a real athlete, all that does is proves that they'll get that in their head that you say, I'm never going to do it. Watch me. Right. And they will work to do it. We do, yeah. Or we just assume, right? So pain is going to be the major fight that we're going to go through with these total knee replacements. What can we do to relieve pain? Well, motion, right? What if they're in the hospital? What should we be using modality-wise to relieve pain? Should we be using heat? They're in for a total knee replacement. Yeah, we should be using ice. Right, especially in that post-surgical initial couple of days, because if we use heat on those knees, what are we going to do to the inflammation? Yeah, we're going to kick it into high gear, right? And so patients may want the heat. Yeah, maybe do therapy after they've taken their pain meds. How long till after they've taken their pain meds is the goal? Yeah, about 30 minutes minimum. 30 minutes minimum. Right? You want to give them about 30 minutes for those pain meds to kind of kick in. So if, especially in a, in a hospital that has a lot of these, that has the um, joint replacement floors, you want to schedule yourself, right? And a lot of them will, you're going to go into the room and say, all right, Mr. Johnson, so tomorrow your physical therapy is scheduled for 9 o'clock and for 2 o'clock.
and you're going to put that on their whiteboard. Most of the, hosp the hospitals should all have whiteboards now because that whiteboard is regulated by JACO, right? Because that helps them know who their nurse is, who their doctors are, everything like that. It should be right in front of them. I often wonder if that's a violation of HIPAA because if you have two people in a room, usually the patient's name's up on it. But, you know, whatever, I guess Jayco's okay with that. Why would we want to put when their physical therapy is up on the wall? Yeah, so the nurse knows when to have their catheter emptied and when to have their meds in them, right? And mentally prepare, exactly. They like to know. They don't like to just go, when to eat too. Yeah, that sucks. Nothing is more annoying than when breakfast or lunch comes late because that will completely and utterly throw off the physical therapy and occupational therapy schedules. You know, I used to, I used to see most of my um, orthopedics at about seven o'clock in the morning. Oh yeah, right? I'd see them about seven o'clock in the morning. Breakfast at our hospital was 6.30. So I knew by seven o'clock they should have had their breakfast and they should have brushed their teeth, usually with OTA by that point, and they're ready for therapy. Yep, OTs love it too. Yeah, it's really annoying. So we want to relieve their pain as much as possible. In the inpatient setting, yeah, we want to use ice. Now they get to outpatient, we get to more of that subacute and onto the chronic phase, we can start doing heat. But don't initially do heat with those patients. And again, range of motion we talked about already, hospital zero to 90. And then once they get out of the hospital, we want to get as close to full range of motion as possible. Strength and endurance, what would be a good manual muscle test grade that you might want for them going out of the hospital? And again, we don't set the goals, but what would be a good number that you'd want at minimum? Okay, at minimum, you want a three, at minimum. At bare minimum, you wanna be able to have them move against gravity. Now, Erica's technically correct because if the patient doesn't have full range of motion, technically the best they can be is a two plus, right? Functionally, we want them to have about a three range of motion or three strength grade. We want them to be able to go against gravity. A four would be ideal and a five would be perfect, right? But yeah, two plus three is kind of where we want them. And then for endurance level and functional activity level, ideally they wanna be able to tolerate at least 30 to 45 minutes of therapy, right? So 30 to 45 minutes of therapy is ideal. Most hospitals, the patient's gonna get about two units of therapy each time. So if they're a, a BID two times a day patient, they're gonna have about an hour of therapy a day because they're gonna get two units out of them. Some other better, some better hospitals, all the patients are scheduled for an hour of therapy a day. I think that's fantastic. I'd love to have an hour with my total knee replacements every day, right? 290s would be great too. Yep, absolutely. That would be fantastic as well. I'm okay with it. I'm talking more of the actual of true acute care versus post-acute. I would love an hour in the hospital of patients. That would be golden. My strokes I get an hour with, but total knees, 23 minutes. And half of my 23 minutes usually is getting them out of bed. Um, other pathologies. Patellofemoral instability and PFPS are obviously other issues we have to deal with. We can treat them all differently. Obviously, we can tape the patella. And we'll, I'll, do some, I'll do a demonstration taping on somebody. But we can tape the patella six ways a Sunday, right? But if we don't fix the problem causing the patellar instability, all we're doing is putting a Band-Aid on it, literally. So patellar taping is great and it does help, but it's just like putting a brace on something, right? A brace doesn't fix the problem, it just makes the problem go away. And sometimes that's all we can do. I'm gonna admit that sometimes there's nothing we can do to fix the problem, their patella is just super hypermobile, and the only thing we can do is tape it. Okay, in that case, that's what we gotta go for, but for the most part, we wanna fix the biomechanical problem. There's all kinds of things. All of these can cause patellofemoral or pain without malalignment. So soft tissue lesions, tight medium lateral retinacula, patellar pressure syndrome, osteochondritis dissecans, where the patella is actually starting to break down, or a femoral trochlea breaking down, 
traumatic patellar chondromalacia. Chondromalacia means what's happening to the back of the patellar, um, what do you call it, cartilage. It's becoming gooey. Yeah, it's softening, right? And at the point it softens in longer cushions. Osteoarthritis, apoptosis is possible. Symptomatic bipartite patella. Oh, that's bad. That means patella splits. And then trauma. All of that can cause it. If you've got patellofemoral dysfunction, we've got to find out what's causing it. That's the main thing we've got to look at. So that's what all this stuff is saying. If you've got a patella pain, we have to find out the cause. So we can't fix it until we find out the cause. Oftentimes, we just diagnose people with PFPS and do the same treatment, but it may not always work for every single patient. So we have to follow the breadcrumbs, figure out what the local factors are, what the distal factors are, what the proximal factors are. Look at the Q angle, look at the formal neck angle, look at you know antroversion versus retroversion, look at valgus versus varus forces on the knee until we can figure out what exactly is causing that problem. You know, modalities for pain and joint effusion, obviously ice, right? If we have acute swelling, we want to ice it. If we have chronic swelling, we want to heat it, right? So we're going to pay attention to what our problems are. And then when we figure out what the problems are, that's when we'll decide what modality to use and also based upon where they are in their recovery. Rest may be common for somebody who's got a really, really acute flare of PFPS, right? Because the only way we're going to rest it is we stop doing it. Splinting or taping, again, we talked about. Muscle setting exercises are great, especially when we're working that VMO. And then range of motion, the pain-free area is good, right? And obviously, the goal is to get them to return to function. When we do mobilizations on the knee, if we've got some problems with teletracking, we are going to do medial glides on them. We're going to try to get that to track medially because that's the way the patella should be moving. A little bit of tipping as well, so getting to kind of tip that way, and then patellar taping as well are kind of our common things. But again, I'm gonna go back to this. Patellar taping is nothing but bracing, so make sure that you correct the problems. VMO, so the vastus medialis oblique, which is just some fibers off of your vastus medialis. A lot of books don't consider that a separate muscle. But if you're working in the knee industry or the knee field, we do consider it a little bit of a separate muscle because it's going to be one that we use for patellar tracking. We can do non-weight bearing activities, all of these non-weight bearing activities. Functional weight bearing activities, we're going to hold until the patient is able to actually weight bear. If their problem is they can't weight bear, then we don't want them to get to closed chain activities. Ideally, what we want to get to is functional activities with a pain-free range. So we want them doing more activities that are along the lines of what they do every day while maintaining a pain-free range of motion. Uh, I have no idea what's modifying biomechanical stresses is looking at maybe they have you know, muscle imbalances. Well, we got to fix the muscles. And our outcome should be patient to be pain-free as or as pain-free as possible in the patella. They can do surgical options, all kinds of surgical options for patella instability as well, right? We can do extensor mechanism realignment surgery where they go in and they move the actual alignment of the extensor tendon of the knee. Anytime that we do that, we can do imbrication or advancement where we actually move the VMO slightly, right? We can do a medial patella femoral ligament or paratightening. We can do con reconstruction. But think about this. Anytime we start opening that knee up just to fix the patella, we're opening that knee up to other problems as well. And that's the main thing down here. The main complication is anytime we do surgery, we open that patient up to all the other surgical risks, right? And also then making that ligament not as strong because anytime we do surgery and stuff like that, the resulting scar tissue is not as pliable and not as elastic as the original tissue that was there. Usually if they do this me mechanism for realignment, they are going to be immobilized and sometimes that can mobilization be six to eight weeks. But remember, if they're immobilized for six to eight weeks, what's going to happen to all those muscles in that area? What's going to happen if you're immobilized for six weeks? Yeah, you're all going to weaken down, right? We found that out. 
seven days of rest is equal to a month of exercise, right? So now you're immobilized for seven months and all those muscles kind of waste away. We need to make sure that they don't, they're immobilized as little as possible. During the maximum protection phase, a lot of times we're gonna mainly focus on just those set exercises for the, the quads, getting that VMO to properly track. And then as we move through the rest of the return to function phase, that's when we start getting into our normal everyday exercises, like your long arm quads, your squats, leg press, activities like that. The outcome should be to, for the patient to have normal function with minimal patellar femoral pain. Distal realignment's exactly like we did. So these terms here, I'm gonna, I put these on here. They are FYI, you do not have to remember these. Just know that if we do a realignment procedures, what the main thing you have to know for your boards, if they do a patellofemoral realignment, what are some complications that can occur from it? Well, obviously, you know, weakening of the soft tissue, infection. Um, immobilization causing weakness. Thank you, Anthony. And then we also have mobilization of patella that can cause it problems. I want to get through these. Patellar tendon transfer, tuber, tub tibial tubercle transfer. Yeah, I've only seen one of these in my life and it did not turn out well, where they actually moved the tibial tubercle. Just imagine, think about that for a second and then cry because that does not work out very well. We talked about the terrible triad, right? What is the terrible triad again? What are the three things injured? Yeah, MMA, right? Good. So all of those get injured in that. Now we can also injure, injure all of these ligaments. And in football, it's not uncommon for a person to come in and have all of these torn. from trauma force to the knee. It's also not uncommon in the martial arts to have them torn too from people blocking and attacking the limbs. Female athlete again, biomechanical risk factors put females more likely to get knee injuries, right? And this is a major argument I hear sometimes about why female athletes aren't as effective as male athletes at certain sports. And I just really dislike that, right? It's just, I don't know. Tell Ronda Rousey she's not effective at MMA once and see how that works out for you. I'm just saying. Right? Or tell some of the WNBA players that they suck at basketball. See how that works out for you. But the main risk, again, the main thing that causes females is, number one, the structural differences, the biomechanical differences that go along with structural, and then hormonal differences. Because you lack that, you know, it's not that you lack testosterone, but you don't have the same levels of testosterone that we have. And I think, guys, is what? Let me snipers too. Yeah, right. I'm gonna say this out loud, guys. I think we should be happy that they don't have as much testosterone as we have because, man, if they could get that mad at us as we get mad, then we're in trouble. I'm just saying. So. Again, non-operative management, the main idea here is for doing non-operative management, we're gonna mainly work on neuromuscular control as our main idea and we'll slowly move to strengthening. If we're doing a ligamentous repair, most of the time they are gonna be immobilized for again, six to eight weeks, or they're gonna be put in a Bledsoe brace. And a Bledsoe is just a brand, but for some reason we call all the braces that are Bledsoe-like Bledsoe, -like Bledsoe braces. And what Bledsoe braces are is they're immobilization braces that have knobs on the side that can allow you to limit the patient for flexion or extension. So maybe we're gonna allow them from five degrees of extension lag to 90 degrees of flexion. It just limits them from going beyond those ranges of motion. Um, it's really common for them to come out in those. Uh, if you ever see a football player on the field or like especially linebacker, or not linebackers, linemen, they often have those big Bledsoe braces on their knees on the outsides. And I don't understand how they move in them because those things are not comfortable. Graft types. The best type of graft that you're going to get is your, out, or your autograft, the one that comes from you, right? 
allographs second best, xenographs third, and then you know, when you end up with other graphs that can be the problem. But understand that if you get an autograph, they have to take that graph from somewhere and they usually take it from the distal hamstring, which means that you're gonna have two surgical sites to worry about then, right? And that means they have to care for both surgical sites and they also are gonna have to work on their hamstring as well while they're working on their knee. So we actually talked about ACL repairs in um, Kines, PCL repair, same idea. It's just gonna, the main reason they're gonna need surgery is if you have a tear big enough that it could rip off. Either ACL, PCL, LCL, or MCL. If the tear is completely torn off and or it's at risk of completely tearing off, that's when they're gonna do surgery. If it's a minor tear, you again want to avoid surgery as much as possible because if you again open up, that can lead to all kinds of problems. And most patients don't care for their surgical sites, just to let you know. Meniscal tears. What do you think is going to cause a meniscus to shear or tear? What type of motion at the knee? So not necessarily flexion, but what about what happens when we get into a full extension? What happens? What's that mechanism that locks us into place? That screw home mechanism, right? So think about it. I rotate up, I lock into place, and I screw home, right? That meniscus is getting twisted. Screw you guys, I'm going home, right? Screw home mechanism. When that happens, that meniscus gets a lot of stress on it. So now let's think you're playing sports and you're running around, you're doing cut drills, and you're going in and out of that screw home mechanism. Think about the stress on that meniscus. Right? That's a good bit of stress, and that's going to rip those meniscus all up. I mean, a sky. Um, ideally, if we can for the meniscal tears, we want to do non-operative, right? But the only time that you, you know, we may do surgery is if the pain from the meniscus tear is greater than the relief we can get from non-operative therapy, right? So if their their meniscus tear is literally causing them not to be able to walk, not to be able to function then we're probably going to have to do some surgery. If we can avoid it, we want to avoid surgery at all costs because again, especially with meniscus surgeries, I usually, I hate to say it, but I've seen patients come out so much worse after a meniscal surgery, a meniscectomy, than when they went in. The muscle doesn't work right. The knee doesn't lock right. They're, they're stuck in extension lag. So, I just would rather, I tell my patients, well, would you go get a meniscus surgery? And I'm going to be honest, I wouldn't. I'd rather live with the torn meniscus and wait until I, you know, get to the point where I may need a total knee replacement, than go in and get a meniscectomy. I just, I've had really, the patients I've seen, and maybe it's just because the only patients I saw were the patients that were bad with meniscectomies, and the people that had a good meniscectomy never came to therapy. But it's just that I've only ever seen bad outcomes from meniscus repairs. Um, usually they're going to be braced for a minimum of six to eight weeks is usually the standard. And then weight bearing their exercises a lot of times with ACL repairs, PCL repairs, and with meniscectomies, they're going to be limited in the motions they're allowed to do. They're not going to be allowed to do a lot of um, a lot of closed chain activities and a lot of squats, a lot of leg presses, stuff like that. They're gonna be very, very, very limited in the amount of motion they're allowed. And especially in this area, I'm gonna tell you, if you have any of um, specifically Dr. Johnson's patients in this area, Dr. Johnson's a fantastic surgeon, but Dr. Johnson has very, very specific protocols. Do not violate his protocols. Because if you do, you'll never hear the end of it. You can't unhear him yelling at you. I'm just telling you, like Kaylee said. All right, so the exercise interventions we're going to do in actual lab. So like foam roller and stuff like this. So we don't have to go through this. We'll do that when we get into lab. All right, let's stop recording.